and we are live streaming on YouTube. Thank you. Thank you very much. Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to the Strategic Development Committee delivered via Zoom and on YouTube. Um, can those uh, with um, a camera on in the Zoom room, can they just uh, put their hand up to confirm they can hear me? Looks like I can be heard. Thank you very much. Um, I'm Daniel Blaney. I'm the Chair of the Strategic Development Committee. Um, I'd like to welcome Councillor Alan Griffiths as a full member of the committee again. He was uh, formerly a substitute member in this um, municipal year. Um, I'm thank, going you, to, thank you. I'm now going to ask uh, all members of the committee and officers to introduce themselves. Um, we'll go in the order um, on page two of the front sheet. Uh, I've done myself, then we go to our vice chair. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Councillor Carly Mee Parkway, Plasto South Ward, and the Vice Chair of the Strategic Development Committee. Hello, Councillor James Beckles, Custom House Ward and member of the committee. Councillor Griffiths, please. Councillor Alan Griffiths, Canning Town South Ward and member of this committee. I think we don't have Maz Patel, do we, in the room? I've got two, two screens of videos. No, uh, um, so it's Councillor Tripp. Thank you. Um, Councillor Rachel Tripp, Forest Gate North Ward. Councillor Verdi. Councillor Havendison Verdi, Bowling Ward. And Councillor Whitworth. Councillor John Whitworth. Oh, sorry. sorry, yes, um, I'm Councillor John Whitworth from West Ham Ward, member of the committee. Um, and, um, I am Jane Custance, I'm the Director of Planning and Development. And welcome um, to this committee, um, it's the first committee um, that I've chaired where, where you've been present, so you're very welcome. Thank you very much. Thank you. I'm James Bolt, Senior Development Manager. Amanda Campbell, uh, Legal Advisor and Solicitor. I'm Narendra Ubi, Principal Transport Planner. I'm Raj Vinder Kaur, um, Planning Officer. I'm Sean Scott, Principal Planning Officer. I'm Adam Silverwood, Planning Officer. And I think Dave, Dave Whitwork, Dave Whitaker. Bottom. Yes, uh, apologies. Uh, my name is Dave Whitaker, I'm the Council's Airport Monitoring Officer. Thank you. Also on the team is myself, Shelley Fortune and the clerk, and Pauline Egan, who's our Zoom um, helper. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. And I believe we also have Neil Dealey, the Chair of the Design Review Panel, um, in the room as well. Yes, thank you very much. OK, um, can I just remind members who I think are now familiar, when a vote is being taken, uh, please raise your hands like so. Um, so that we can capture this on the screen. Um, item one is apologies for absence. Do we have any apologies for absence? None received, Chair. Thank you. And I should just say I've seen on a, another screen, we also have uh, another officer here, which is um, Ben Hull, our strategic design manager. Thank you. Um, OK, item two, declarations of interest. Are there any declarations of interest um, I can see Alan and then James. I'm going to be scrolling between screens. Alan. Yes, thank you, Chair. I've sent some notes to the committee officer. I don't think they're very large things, but uh, I thought I'd better declare them. Um, I've been dealing as case work with some issues of nuisance in the private road in the car park at the Crystal. And I had 50th and 60th birthday parties at the Railway Tavern. And I used to be a governor of Lister School. Thank you very much. James Beckles. Thanks, Chair. Um, item five, I just want to say that I met with Mount Anvil, who were doing a consultation as part of the Crystal application, although I gave them no advice, but I did listen to what they had to say. Thank you. I don't think anyone else is indicating, so I'm going to move on. Uh, item three, determining planning applications. Uh, can uh, members note the following advice uh, from the head of legal services um, on the agenda. Uh, can I just see an indication from members that they have noted that advice? Thank you. Um, and then it's announcements from the chair. Um, I've got quite a list, quite a bit here. Um, so I'm going to start with the committee has received uh, the following request to address the committee. 
Uh, we haven't done sound checks on everyone, so could people just please confirm they're here? We can hear them. For item five, the crystal, I believe we're um, hearing from Mary Hartley. Uh, yes, Chair, I'm here. Thank you. And Ricardo Hyatt. Is that right? Yes, I'm here. Thank you very much. Um, I understand there's a number of other uh, members of your team who are here to answer questions. Um, if I'm permitted, I'm going to skip through for time uh, and um, hopefully they, their sound will work. Uh, I also understand we have two objectors. Imran Hamad, is he here? Yeah, here. Thanks. Thank you very much. And Dave Coppard. Hello, I'm in support, but yes. You're in support, I do apologise. OK. Um, item six, the Railway Tavern, Jeffield. Is here, Chair. Is here. Can sound working? He's on mute at the moment. Sorry, I'm here. Can you hear Great. me? Great. Yes, thank you very much. Brian O'Neill. Uh, yes, thank you, Chair. I'm here. Thank you. Ian Thody. Yes, Chair, I'm here. Thank you. And then I, item seven, I've got David Coppard, who I assume is the same David Coppard. Is that right? Yep, that's me. Thanks. Thank you. Um, item eight, Lister Community School, Richard True. Uh, yes, I'm here. Thank you. Thank you. Jim Robinson. Yep, I'm here. Thank you. Simon Brown. I'm here. And item nine is Philip Taylor. Do we have Philip Taylor? It's a lot of people. I can't Sound work. tell. Was that yes? On mute at the moment. Sorry, I'm here. Yeah, could just about hear you. Thank you very much. Right. Um, having done that, could I ask that um, people not um, uh, on the item on the agenda that we're discussing now switches off their camera? Um, that obviously doesn't include members of the committee. Um, the um, usual practice is to allow up to five minutes um, in total for both supporters and objectors. Can I check that's agreed by members? Thank you. Um, I've got a couple of other suggestions about the order of the agenda. First of all, item seven um, is not, a, um, there's a recommendation for approval on some delegated authority in relation to a section 106 um, agreement. Um, we're not the um, the relevant authority. The, this has already been approved by the GLA. It's about outstanding section 106 matters. Um, because of the nature of it, I'm suggesting we deal with it after dealing with full matters on items eight and nine. So we take item seven after item nine. Um, are members happy with that? Uh, looks like it. Thank you very much. And secondly, Chair, yes, Harvey. Chair, I'm, I'm, I'm sorry. I'm just a bit mindful that uh, we have got an agenda item, which is the crystal mm. uh, agenda item five. Um, the, the building where I work, they are one of the tenants in there. So I'm just letting the committee know. It shouldn't, it's not a declaration of interest, but just for clarity that they do occupy two floors where I work. Okay. I don't have any contact with any of the staff apart from good morning. All right. So just on that and agenda item two, does the legal officer have anything to add or is that fine? Uh, no, that's lovely you've said that, but um, not a declarable interest. So we're happy with that. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, and on the agenda, I just want to suggest, uh, looking at item 10, I'm sure all members of the committee have read the report which has to come to this committee for noting. Uh, my proposal, uh, which I have um, discussed with the presenting officer, is um, we can vote to note that without discussion today. I'm concerned about not giving that the time it deserves. And my proposal on that agenda item is that we defer substantive discussion um, to a, a subsequent meeting where that is the main agenda item. Uh, perhaps um, a daytime meeting, obviously in public, uh, on a future occasion. Can, is there any dissent from members that we um, that we deal with matters today on that item in that way? Um, no one's dissenting, so that that's going to be my suggestion when we get to item ten. Okay, thank you very much. 
Right, substantive items, agenda item five on page 15 of the bundle um, is um, the Crystal Building. First of all, we're going to have a presentation from the applicant who I believe may be sharing a screen. Yes, I'll share the screen now. Thank you very much. Uh, you have up to five minutes to address us. You do not have to use the full five minutes and um, I will give you a little warning beforehand. Oops. Thank, thank you. Are you ready for me to start then, Chair? I'm ready, thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, so uh, good evening, members of the Strategic Development Committee. Uh, I'm Mary Harpley, I'm Chief Officer at the, Gen at the GLA, and here to introduce briefly our planning application for use of the Crystal Building and associated uh, alterations uh, to accommodate the relocation of City Hall. Uh, I'm here with Ricardo Hyatt, one of our executive directors uh, and other members of GLA staff who will answer questions that you may have. So subject to planning permission, the Mayor of London intends to make the Crystal the permanent home of the Mayor, the London Assembly and the GLA from autumn 2021. Uh, we would re relocate to the Crystal from our current City Hall at Tower Bridge. We own the Crystal, which is currently underutilised, and upon review, we feel it is a good fit for City Hall in its design and arrangement. We would make significant savings to our operating costs at the GLA by making this move. And of course, that is in the context of significant cuts to regional and local government. And we think we would be supporting the ongoing regeneration of the Royal Docks Enterprise Zone, where of course we have a joint Mayor of Newham and Mayor of London team managing an ambitious program of transformation. Prior to the submission of the application, we did engage with the uh, community uh, local to the Crystal and the location of the respondents to our pre-application consultation are here on the map. Um, we set out the uh, details of this in the statement of community involvement, which of course we have submitted as part of the application. But you can see from this slide that pre-application, the response is overwhelmingly welcomed the proposed change of use at the Crystal, and also considered that our proposal to relocate City Hall to the Crystal would support wider regeneration and benefit the local area. Of course, there have been a number of responses uh, since to the statutory consultation, and I just wanted to highlight um, that we have considered those comments very carefully uh, and responded to them uh, as detailed in this slide. Uh, public access will continue to the crystal. Uh, the areas of public access are shown in yellow on this plan. The cafe, the ex exhibition areas, the, the new London living room and committee and meeting rooms will all be made accessible to the public during the specified hours. Our section 106 also captures that access to, these, to the building and to exhibitions would be free to new and residents under 18s and school groups. Uh, we have confirmed that we will make the rear of the building secure to ensure proper functioning of the use, but the key areas of public space around the building will continue to be publicly accessible. This will ensure north-south walking routes are maintained, high quality public realm and waterside open space is retained and changes to pedestrian crossings will not interrupt pedestrian connectivity from the area to the Royal Dock DLR, Royal Victoria DLR station. Organised events will continue to take place in public areas around the Crystal and the GLA will work positively with event organisers through an events protocol. The potential for protests at, um, at what would become the new City Hall will also be managed. We are planning a welcoming and safe environment for visitors and residents and staff. Thank we, you've got one minute, just okay. so you know. Thank okay, you. Okay, thank you very much. Um, we'll manage the, um, the crime risk, as you can see on this slides. We believe there are a number of benefits to Newham um, uh, as, a, 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 as a council 
from our proposed relocation, both in terms of increased jobs in the local area, increased footfall to the area. Ewan will become under this plan the home of London's regional government, and we believe we will contribute to Newham's community wealth building agenda. And in terms of benefits to the local community, again, you can see them here, but they improved access to the crystal I've already talked about. We think we, we are absolutely committed to working with workplace to improve local labor opportunities. Uh, we will retain high quality architecture and public realm. And, um, and we believe, and it is borne out by the application, that that can all be done with limited impact on existing infrastructure and accelerating regeneration and investment. Um, I hope that is um, at a clear uh, opening to our application. Thank you. Thank, thank you very much. Um, we now move to, well, I do apologize. I've slightly mishandled this because I thought Dave Coppard was an objector. Um, you actually wanted to speak in support of this. Is that right? That's correct. Um, okay, because it's my error, um, uh, you would have normally have shared the time with the the, um, the applicant. Do you want to say a few words now, keeping it reasonably brief? Thank That's you. That's fine. I'll be quick. Oh, am I there? Hello. Yeah, you are. I yeah, want... thanks. Yeah, yeah. I'm just speaking in support of it. I agree with what the applicants have put forward. Those very high approval numbers are consistent with conversations I've had with people in the local area and a lot of excitement about it. Um, I'll yield to my colleague to do the, the proper objection, but the only things I've heard is concerns about uh, whether we have a meaningful commitment to permanent security, as in at least some security or police presence 24 hours a day, that would be nice, and assurances around public access and how restrictive the fencing would be, which is actually in the presentation, so happy to see that, and yeah, looking forward to, to seeing it here, but I shall be interested to know what my colleague says in the objection. Thank you. Thank you very much. So um, that's now uh, we've had a, a minute and a half I've got uh, in support. So uh, Imran Hamad, would you like to address us and I will give you five and a half minutes in those circumstances. Thank you. A apologies, my camera's not on. I, I just don't have that functionality. Um, I live in the apartment next door to the Crystal. I think the council should reject this proposal. Of the public comments on the Newham website, only 33% are in support of this proposal. I myself objected. My objection was apparently so eloquent that several newspapers picked up on it. One of my quotes even made it into a headline. It went like this. Moving from City Hall to the Crystal to save money is like selling a Rolls Royce to buy a Mercedes and then claiming to be frugal. I'd encourage you all to Google it, it's good fun. Many of the objections online were focused on planning specific considerations. For example, that there wasn't enough parking available locally to support this. I don't know what makes people think the government has any incentive to provide parking for residents who come and see them. Of course they don't. They have no incentive to provide that kind of level of service. There's no competition. The government at any given time has a monopoly on the business of governing. Real businesses, on the other hand, have an interest in making sure there's enough parking available for their customers. More parking equals more customers equals more sales equals more money. Government has no such incentive, so why would they bother? The crystal should be used by businesses, not government. The GLA spoke of the benefits the proposal would supposedly bring, so I'd like to challenge those assertions. The proposal claims it will save money. Compared to what? The crystal is not the only option available. Government employees like yourselves can work from home or they can work from any number of cheap office buildings. Why are taxpayers being forced to pay for government employees to occupy prestigious buildings in prime locations? Multi-million pound gleaming futuristic buildings. Why does government need to occupy such expensive buildings? And why do taxpayers have to pay for them? Local businesses, Businesses that actually produce things and create wealth can only dream of occupying such buildings. The proposal says it's important for government to occupy buildings that have status. At what cost? The government will present all sorts of figures for how much will be saved by moving to the crystal, but we'll never know how much has been lost by allocating this building to the government rather than private enterprise. 
Who knows what productive businesses might have occupied the building if the government hadn't claimed it for themselves? Who knows how taxpayers might have used the extra money in their pockets if the government hadn't taken it away from them to pay for their expensive offices? Why not let the market decide who should occupy the building? Why does government think it knows better? Haven't we seen time and again that the more power and status governments have, the more incentive there is for special interest groups to lobby them? If the government didn't have their fingers in every pie, there would be no point in spending millions on lobbying them. If government didn't control who gets licensed and who doesn't, who gets planning permission, who gets awarded lucrative contracts and who doesn't, nobody would care. I wouldn't be spending my evening here and nor would any of you. If this proposal goes ahead, the crystal will act as tasty bait to attract more and more lobbyists. We don't need any more crony capitalism. Good old fashioned regular capitalism and free markets work just fine. The proposal claims the move will boost the local economy. What hard evidence do they have for that? Does government have a track record of boosting the economy by buying up or otherwise occupying expensive buildings? Where's the evidence? Why don't they just buy up every building in Newham if that's the case? Then the local economy would not only be boosted, it would be soaring high. Every Newham resident would be a billionaire. That's nonsense, of course. Government spending never leads to more prosper prosperity. They can only spend what they have already taken from us. Eventually, they run out of other people's money. The government says it's investing in the local area. Governments do not invest. They take money from people who invest, who produce, who create. They take it by force and then pour it down a bottomless pit. How will we possibly measure whether or not the government has boosted the local economy compared to what might have been if actual businesses had occupied the Christian instead? You've got uh, one minute. Thanks. Thank you. I won't need it. If the council approves this application, it would only be encouraging more wasteful behavior. Rather than encouraging the government to move into the borough, the council should be encouraging businesses to move in. Those who actually produce, who actually create wealth and who actually create prosperity. Thank you. Thanks very much. Um, uh, all parties who've spoken, please, uh, do uh, stay uh, with us in case there are questions. But what I'd rather do, unless a member of the committee has a burning question, is go to the uh, presentation of our planning officer first, uh, who is Rajvinder, I think. Yes, thank you. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. I'll share my screen now. Thank you. Can I confirm you can see my screen? Yep, thank you. Thank you, Chair. Good afternoon, members. This item is for the proposal at the Crystal Item 5. The site is outlined in red and is located within the south of the borough on the west side of the Royal Victoria Dock. Siemens Brothers Way runs down around the west side of the site. The application seeks the change of use of the Crystal Building from an exhibition and conference centre with ancillary uses to a civic centre use sui generis, comprising committee chamber and rooms, ancillary exhibition and conference space, ancillary office, ancillary cafe, together with associated alterations, including access and servicing, parking enclosure, security kiosk, security fence, accessible vehicle parking, cycle parking, and the erection of flagpoles. In this aerial photo, the site is outlined in yellow and is adjacent to the docks. The existing residential is to the north and east, the existing commercial uses are located to the northeast, comprising hotels such as the Ibis, Sunborn, Good Hotel, which is within the dock, restaurants and the Excel Exhibition Centre. Royal Victoria DLR is located to the north of the site and is the nearest DLR station and the Emirates cable car to the east. This image shows the higher rise nature of the residential that surrounds the site in comparison to the relatively low rise nature of the application site, including the highway infrastructure to the west. These are the images of the application site 
and shows some of the public realm and the existing residential within the towers, within the rear of the images. These images are the view south from the road to the north and southeast from the dock edge. This plan shows the proposed site layout, which includes the three new flagpoles on the western side of the site, the highway layout changes to the north of the site, two blue badge bays within the north of the site, and additional cycle parking to the north and servicing and parking alterations to the west. This plan shows the extent of the fencing highlighted in orange, proposed in the context of the wider site in the left image, and then a closer look at the site area with fencing in more detail within the image on the right. The area to the southwest of the site, members asked to know, is already enclosed by highway infrastructure and existing walls of the energy centre and will be creating a more secure area within the southwest of the site. This plan shows the areas that are accessible to the members of the public in yellow. This includes the committee rooms, the main exhibition conference space, meeting rooms, cafe, public gallery and a, an additional meeting area. Areas that are accessible to staff are in green and areas that consist of back of house are in grey. Key planning considerations are the principle of development, design, transport and travel and the impact upon amenity. Principle of development. The site forms part of an area of the borough that is designated as the Royal Docks Opportunity Area within the London Plan and also is an enterprise zone where jobs and housing growth are expected to be accelerated. The site also forms part of the Royal Victoria West strategic site and the employment hub E9, which supports new residential, cultural and leisure uses, along with high quality public realm, improved walking and cycling links within indicative building heights of up to 19 storeys. The employment hub also focuses on visitor business and conference uses. In terms of master planning, the application site has sufficiently demonstrated accordance with the design and technical criteria of master planning. The application site in the context of the wider strategic site and also in tandem with the adjoining landowners. A sequential assessment was also undertaken and concludes that in terms of other suitable or alternative sites within the borough in the identified centres, there are none that would be suitable for this use. In reflecting the relevant policy considerations, the proposed use is therefore considered appropriate in land use terms and justified having regard to the sequential assessment. In terms of replacing the existing D1 use and the provision of the sui generis use, Given a mix of uses proposed, which includes the exhibition space and the civic function, the proposal would provide a replacement facility in the form of a sui generis civic function and therefore not involve any loss of community use to other uses, therefore meeting the relevant policy tests. Overall, the proposals have the potential to make a significant contribution to the promotion of this area as a high quality business area, raising its profile and contributing to further regeneration of the raw docks. The proposals would continue to provide sustainable premises that will be accessible to visitors and would not prejudice development coming forward on the adjoining portions of land. Officers are satisfied that the proposals represent an appropriate scheme in accordance with the site allocations and development plan policies. In terms of design and appearance, the building is in existence and of a high quality with relatively limited external works proposed. The proposed internal and external alterations are considered to be appropriate and in keeping with the appearance of the site. The siting of the vehicular and cycle parking enclosures is considered to be appropriately placed and the materials are of a high quality. Strategic design are supportive of the proposals and request a wider landscape strategy in relation to the undeveloped plots of land. A landscape master plan and separated, separate landscaping condition is to be secured by a condition to ensure cohesiveness across the strategic site and in order to meet allocations. Overall, the design is considered to be acceptable in the context of the surrounding area and would not prejudice development within the wider strategic site according in accordance with relevant policies. The design is therefore supported. In terms of transportation, the site achieves a PTL of two, indicating poor access to public transportation, but is within 10 minutes walk of Royal de Victoria Dock DLR station in proximity of Ape Bay, Brompton bike docking station within the vicinity of the site and a number of bus routes. The application proposes a reduction in parking from 12 to five car parking spaces, two of which are standard bays and three accessible bays. An increase in cycle parking is also proposed to 116 cycle parking spaces. LBN Transportation have reviewed the application and are supportive of the proposal subject to recommended conditions and heads of terms relating to a travel plan, a section 278 agreement for the highway works, electric vehicle charging points contributions 
construction logistics and the delivery and servicing plans. Overall, with regard to transportation, the proposals are supported. In terms of the impact to the neighbouring amenity, of the 4,849 neighbours consulted, eight objections and five comments in support and four general comments were received, which have been considered within the officer report. Officers consider the proposal unlikely to give rise to any additional noise than the established use of the crystal as an exhibition and conference centre. The proposal subject to conditions would not present any significantly adverse impacts to neighbouring sites in terms of noise, disturbance, overlooking, loss of privacy, light and sunlight. The proposals are therefore supported. A committee update has been provided which updates the hours of construction to be in line with the ministerial statement allowing relaxed hours of construction. The condition has been amended in line with this but for internal works only. Members are asked to note the committee update and resolve to agree the reasons for approval as set out in the report and delegate authority to the Director of Planning and Development to grant planning permission subject to the completion of a legal agreement under Section 106 of the Town and Country Planning Act 1990 as amended based on the heads of terms identified at Appendix 2 and the conditions listed in Appendix 1 of the report. Thank you. Thank you. Can I see the screen of members? Um, oh, actually, this works. Okay, right. Who, members, who wants to uh, say anything or ask questions? Let me look around. Great. And then. Okay, so I'm going to go Rachel, then Alan, then John at this stage, and then I've got James Beckles. Okay, Rachel. Thank you, Chair. Um, there were a couple of areas that I was hoping to get a little bit of um, mm. more detail or some comments on. Um, the first one was, um, I was a little bit surprised not to see more detail about the plans for the landscaping in the public realm. It occurred to me that we quite often see applicant teams with a whole separate officer who comes to speak to us about landscaping. Um, and obviously, I mean, you know, landscaping and public realm is always important, but particularly important with a building like this, which presumably is intended to have a really quite significant civic presence. Um, and so I guess I just wanted to I mean, firstly emphasize that, um, I'm, I guess query, are we going to be able to get the very, very highest quality public realm that we can um, by leaving the detail to a condition? Um, to encourage the officers to make sure they pursue that um, and also if appropriate perhaps just to hear a tiny bit from the applicant about how far along you are with the public realm design um, and, and and sort of thoughts and plans you have about like I say making it accessible and welcoming um, and maintenance and you know biodiversity and urban drainage and all those other kind of things that we like to see. Um, shall we if I note that shall we try and come back to that both with the officers and the applicants if you got another point and yeah sure yeah. the other point is um maybe me missing something i was a bit um confused on page 23 it talks about reducing the number of existing parking spaces um which is entirely in line with our transport plans but i don't know why we need to have five of the spaces it says there are three blue badge and two secure parking um don't we just need blue badge spaces for this building and everybody else um arrives by public transport or via active travel in line with our and indeed the Mayor of London's transport policy. Yeah okay let's come back to those what I want to do is hear from all the members obviously I will interrupt if there's kind of a specific question with a simple answer but let's just go around the room for now. Alan uh, we can't hear you. No Thanks. Yes, you, you lucky man. You, I'm afraid you can hear me now. Uh, thank you, Chair. Uh, I've got two kinds of questions, both to do with disturbance to neighbours. Um, I'm looking at this supplementary that talks about external demolition construction works going up to 2100 Mondays to Saturdays. And I'm wondering what on earth that is, because uh, residents in Tidal Basin Road complained about demolition work, I think, further away from their homes on the other side of Silvertown Way when uh, some redundant concrete structure was being demolished at some ridiculous hour in the morning at a weekend. So that external works that late into the evening bothers me a lot. And I wonder if this ministerial statement amounts to the law or an intention to make regulations in the period concerned. Uh, my other one is about security of the site. 
particularly the parts of the site that are furthest away from the building and closest to Tidal Basin Road, because there's been a persistent problem of intruders in the private road and in the car park area that's to the west of the application site, which is a bit closer to Tidal Basin Road. People with noisy cars late in the evening and leaving drugs paraphernalia about and blaring music. So I'd, I'd like an assurance um, that the GLA staff are going to secure the whole site early in the process to shut those disturbances out. Thank you. Thank, thank you very much, John Whitworth. And then yes, thank I've you, seen Harvinder. Thank you. I've got a question about staffing because we're told uh, on page 27, 10, uh, this would be a relocation of 500 members of staff with only 226 members of staff able to occupy the building at one time. I just wondered how this was going to work. And is this a similar working arrangement to what happens at City Hall or will it will the nature of the building mean quite a, rad a radical alteration? So how will that um, the staffing, uh, uh, the working pattern operate um, inside the building? And the other question I have is something I've known in the past, but I'd just like to be refreshed in my mind about um, uh, how will the capacity of the DLR, um, how will the DLR capacity at um, Royal Victoria uh, increase over the years? What will be the, the rate of in, uh, mm. increasing capacity? Thank you. Thank you. I've got James Beckles and I had seen Harvinder as well. So James Beckles. Thanks, Chair. Um, my question's about um, energy and sustainability on page 67. Um, there's a lot of reference to the policy requirements of the London plan and the fact the building's already um, established and it's energy efficient. But I just want to understand really from um, the developers or, or the applicants um, to list the sustainability credentials of what they're going to do once they're in the building, you know, to, well, to either go beyond what the building is and to, or to maintain it, link it to the, um, the London heat network. And also, and it's, and it's probably from the, um, the, the sorry, one of the, the um, speakers who was dissenting, how will um, the, and it's not to the dissenter, but it's around his question, um, how will uh, the London Mayor's Office actually invigorate the economy uh, locally and mm. through, through planning and applicate through planning of, um, of this building? Great. And then Harvinder. Yeah, Chair, thank you. I understand we are in difficult times with COVID-19 at the moment. Um, considering that uh, nearly 5,000 letters are sent out for consultation, and only 17 were received back. Did the applicant try any other venues or have any, any other avenues to try to get some of the consultation coming back to them uh, in any way? Okay, thank you. I think that was everyone who indicated. I only had what some of what I was thinking about has already been covered. I had an additional thought about active travel which Rachel mentioned which is the um, the location it's obviously is a, a as said in the report a, um, application for it to be the, the seat of regional government this is a location uh, which people from all over London will be traveling to and it's a it's an area that doesn't look na naturally or um, uh, immediately hospitable, say, for example, for walking and cycling, unless you're kind of doing the perimeter of the dock. And I'm interested in how we are going to make the destination from other parts of London uh, with places like Quietway 22, like Cycle Soup Highway 3, uh, not that far away. How are we going to make uh, the, the message that this is um, somewhere you can get to through sustainable means? So there's a few transport questions there. A lot of concern about the 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 site in terms of security disturbance, um, particularly construction works, um, which Alan asked about. Uh, but then we've got some transport concerns and a good question from James about sustainability, which we can always do better at, even if the uh, building is already um, rated well. Uh, it's uh, it's an ongoing project to 
uh, maintain sustainability at the maximum. And uh, there was John Whitworth's question on staffing arrangements and uh, Harvinder's question about community engagement. So can I ask first, does the applicant want to say anything on those questions? And then I'll come to our officers. Well, oh, thank you, Chair, um, uh, and thanks to uh, uh, committee members for their questions. Um, I will try to um, pick up uh, sort of general points and um, allocate uh, for specific responses to um, colleagues who are also on the call. Um, so, uh, firstly, um, in regards to um, the working arrangements, um, the question that uh, uh, was raised by Councillor Whitworth. Uh, so, so just to outline uh, further context, um, we are intending, um, once we occupy the building, um, to operate um, a policy of flexible working, remote working for staff, alongside um, uh, our other building at Union Street um, in Southwark that we will occupy. Um, so we will have 500 uh, just over 500 staff anchored at the Crystal. But over the course of the week, uh, although staff will be attending on different days, over the course of the week, on any given day, um, the maximum capacity is 226. But there will be um, you know, over 500 staff anchored at, the, anchored at the building. So that will be their place of work. Um, but you know, recognising the technology and the lessons that we've learned um, through our whole experience with COVID, and to be fair, um, a significant transformation program as an organization that we had kicked off um, pre the pandemic. Um, this is just a continuation of, of that policy. So um, I'm hope, I hope that provides you a bit of clarity as to the working arrangements. Um, so I'm just, just gonna try to go through the questions in turn and as I say, allocate to colleagues. Um, uh, so the other question I am going to pick up and allocate to my colleague um, Dan Bridge, who is the Programme Director for the Royal Docks team, um, is in regards to the public realm works and how um, our ambitions will be aligned and, and enhance the um, broader area. So I'll hand over to Dan to respond to that. Hi everyone, um, and this is a guest specifically responding to Rachel's question, Council Tripp's question in relation to the public realm works. Um, some of you that will have been to the docks recently will know that um, the, the the significant part of public realm that sits in front of the Crystal Building was subject to a separate planning consent by the um, planning application by the Royal Docks team uh, two years ago to upgrade. The, um, the, the public realm, significant part of public realm in front of the building and those works were completed earlier this year. So um, they're a really significant piece of public realm known as crystal gardens that are used for events and that's why they're not subject to this planning application. Um, the landscape strategy, uh, which is a condition, um, refers into the main to the public realm that sits behind the building of which we're currently um, in, in discussions with Newham, the owner of that site, to ensure that as that part of the site comes forward, um, the, the landscape proposals are sort of high quality um, and, and fit with the remainder of the works that we've done around the rest of the building. So hopefully that answers your question. Thank you, Thank you Dan. Um, so there were a number of um, transport related questions raised um, and I am going to pass um, over to um, Chris Mullet um, of Bureau Hapold, who is our transport advisor, um, to respond to those, and then we can sweep up and pick up any loose ends after that. So, uh, Chris. Yes, hi there. Um, hi, everyone. Thank you very much. Um, so, I think there was a question first off about um, car parking. Um, it was noted that there's a, a, an overall reduction in car parking on site. Uh, proposed um, and the the number of uh, accessible spaces was mentioned at uh, proposing three spaces uh, so and I think then the question was uh, why are we providing two further uh, spaces and those are allocated as secure spaces for the mayoral function of the building uh, I think that answers the question um, the I think then the the next point was uh, regarding uh, cycle, um, improvements and how we would encourage um, cycle accessibility to the site. I think the answer there is uh, twofold. Um, 
firstly as a as a passive measure which is continuous through the lifetime of the development is to um, encourage cycling through the travel plan uh, that's obviously aimed at primarily employees um, and and uh, visitors to to the site on a regular basis uh, the second is through um, uh, improvements to the public realm um, which have been delivered uh, around the area um, clearly they the immediate focus around the raw docks uh, such as through the uh, raw dots public framework uh, which sets out improvements to cycling connectivity in the area um, specific measures uh, including the configuration of the western gateway tidal basin road junction uh, to create a more hospitable environment for cyclists and uh, and to the uh, cycle environments on the Silvertown Way viaduct. And then um, the uh, potential for extending cycle lanes at the East and North Woolwich Road along Dock Road, uh, which would connect to the um, reconfigured um, Tidal Basin uh, Silvertown Tunnel uh, Junction, which would create a continuous cycle route to the south of the site, uh, connects North Woolwich Road to Tidal Basin Road and to, to the west to the Lowly Crossing. And so those um, are the, the key factors that we're, we're um, uh, referring to in the transport assessment that would encourage cycle uh, use uh, to the site. I think that was uh, the two key things. I think, I'm oh, sorry, there was a, a further point um, about the funding of the DLR improvements. The, um, the planned uh, improvements to the DLR um, would deliver significant improvements in capacity, uh, which are set out in the application. Um, it, it's unfortunately it's, uh, th um, the, the, the scheduling of those works are, are a matter for TFL. And we don't have that level of detail, I'm afraid, at this point uh, that I can I can report back to committee this time. Uh, thank you very much, Chris. Um, so I, I will now pick up um, the questions that have been raised in regards to security. So I, I will address a few of the points and then. I will hand over to my colleague, um, Simon Grinter. Um, so, so firstly, um, in regards to security more generally and you know, our contribution, uh, should we uh, receive uh, planning consent tonight and, and, and ultimately occupy the building, is um, it's, it's worth highlighting that with our um, presence in the building, um, there will be an increase uh, presence, there will be an increase in the number of people um, um, uh, working in and uh, uh, walking around the building and um, creating a, a natural uh, level of surveillance, um, which um, will hopefully help to um, disrupt um, and or um, uh, uh, lead to a means to, um, for those who, who are wishing to undertake certain activities, um, uh, uh, to, to put them off um, in effect. And um, in terms of the wider security arrangements, um, they are twofold. So there are some elements of, of, of security required, um, at, uh, uh, which directly link on to um, the highways works. But then there are also some um, security improvements required um, to the building, uh, which has been muted earlier. Um, so I thought it was it would be helpful to sort of, uh, provide a bit of an oversight there. And I'll just hand over to my colleague Simon Grinter now, who can elaborate um, a little bit further. Thank you. Um, I think one of the um, important things to note is that um, the GLA has a very skilled team of security staff, in-house security staff, who would be moving to this site and there would be a 24-7 presence on the site, both within and outside the building, um, which again I think would um, improve the profile of the site in relation to antisocial behaviour um, and um, some of the crime and disturbance issues that have been spoken about. Um, so our staff would, would, would engage both with visitors um, and with any issues on the site and that would be 24 hours a day and we also as you um, have mentioned and picked up will be working on some physical security measures in relation to uh, fencing security posts and that kind of thing in the area to the rear of the building which is where where i think councillor griffiths you were um, mentioning the antisocial behavior and um, we fully expect that this will have a, a very positive impact 
Can I just um, uh, go back to, the, I think the point Alan made in particular was um, uh, an assurance about how early, as you say this is approved, how early that uh, securing of the site, if you're planning to move in, go live as it were in Oct October and have 24 hour presence then, how early are we gonna see you ensuring that there's the kind of security that's not gonna create problems um, as there's a change of use? We, we will engage as, as soon as possible. Obviously, we're going to be doing some refurbishment works there, and it's very important for us that the site is secure um, do, doing those works. Um, we have a lot of activity going on, and once those works are finished, then the GLA will take over the full management of the site and manage it in a very similar way to the way we manage our current city hall. Uh, thank you, Simon. Um, so I'll, I'll just pick up on um, a, a uh, few points. Um, the main one being um, in regard to uh, comments earlier in respect to the benefits, um, the economic benefits and, and you know, the impact that of the relocation of um, City Hall to the Royal Docks and to the Crystal Building will have. And um, one, one thing to highlight um, by way of a comparison or parallel is if, if we think back um, to um, when the GLA first opened its doors and um, the building uh, at Tower Bridge was opened, um, we were one of the first occupants um, of more London, of that area. And um, we've seen over the last 20 years, the, impact, the increasing footfall and the attraction of businesses and a general hive of activity around the area that the GLA as one of the early um, uh, sort of occupiers of the area played a key role in, 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 in supporting. Now, clearly the Royal Docks um, uh, uh, regeneration is already on the way. And um, we do have a joint team, the mayor set up a joint team uh, with uh, the, the mayor of uh, Newham to take forward the regeneration of the Royal Docks. But we believe that having a presence there and given the level of investment and, 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 and the scale of assets um, that the GLA already has in the area, that um, you know, our presence in the area will seek to you know, help to enhance that. And you know, with the support that we're going to provide, um, you know, the engagement of the local community, access to the building, um, we certainly believe that we will have a positive impact in relocating uh, to the area. Um, I'm just going to hand over now to Neil Lawrence, um, who is going to provide a bit more information about the wider economic benefits. Thank you, Ricardo. Um, yes, the um, application was supported by a comprehensive uh, economic statement, um, which was prepared having regard to the objectives um, for the opportunity area in which the site is located, and also noting that uh, it's in the only enterprise zone um, in London. Um, and really what that captures is uh, some of the principles that we see it as a catalyst for the regeneration, uh, helping to support the regeneration of the area uh, in the same way that City Hall has, as Ricardo has noted. Some of those benefits are captured all through the Section 106 agreement. So um, in particular, local labour in accordance with Newham's policies for construction full-time employment for the end use. Um, Another fundamental principle is the higher footfall um, from staff and visitors um, to the Crystal, uh, which will support local businesses in the surrounding area um, uh, through net spend. Um, and we think that's in line with the economic objectives uh, for the Royal Docks, as well as the social infrastructure role, um, which, which is really important, including um, lectures, conferences, um, and education events. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Neil. And, and, and now I'm going to hand over to my colleague, Steve Sheesby, who is going to pick up Councillor Beckel's um, question on sustainability. Uh, Steve. Ricardo, um, just uh, on the sustainability points, what I wanted to confirm is that um, the sustainability statement and the energy statement submitted as part of the application set out the um, sustainability sustainability benefits arising from the uh, from the proposal. Um, 
As we, as we, as you may know, the existing building is certified as a BREEAM outstanding building and a LEED platinum building. And the reuse of the building and refurbishment of that existing building has sustainability benefits in itself. Um, there will be um, a number of changes to the building that we will incorporate in terms of upgrades and improvements as we move forward with the work, uh, that including such matter uh, changes to the lighting system within the building and our assessment through the energy assessment and our modeling suggests that that will achieve a carbon saving of up to 20%. Um, the, uh, there are other benefits um, arising as well in terms of retention of very key, key features such as green roof structures on the building that will um, provide benefits to biodiversity and we will be uh, enhancing the water efficient fixtures and fittings within the building, including the existing rainwater harvesting system in the building. The ability for, the, uh, given the building has such a high, sustain, high sustainability standard as it stands, means that the, obviously the works that we are doing are to upgrade and to tweak those as much as we are possible, are possibly, are possible to do. Uh, and bring them up to current day standards. Um, the intention is that we will continue to, to uh, target a Hybriam um, assessment as part of the works moving forward and to ensure that as we undertake our construction works, we um, comply with a very high sustainability standard. Thank you. Thank you, Steve. Um, I believe we've addressed all of the questions. However, I, actually, I think I think there was one more. Um, there, so there's a question on yeah, the, the engagement that Harbinder asked about whether, whether there was anything else you could have done. There was also a question, but I mean, I can I'm, I'm going to go to our officers in a moment and they may be able to assist about the words in that Alan was asking about about the 2100 hours uh, external works. Uh, but um, I will go to the officers for their interpretation of what that means. So carry on on engagement. Uh, yeah, so on, on engagement, um, so separate to, as outlined in the presentation, separate to the statutory consultation, we ran a, a, pre, a, a consultation pre-submission, um, which um, was, was um, involved um, a number of avenues, um, electronic means, um, virtual meetings, and um, uh, the uh, proposals, the website was viewed by more than 800, 870 um, people. Um, and um, a, we, uh, the, the exhibition um, was sent to over 3,900 addresses in the area. And um, overwhelmingly, um, as outlined in the presentation earlier, earlier there was um, a positive response. So it, it, it's just to clarify that we did go above and beyond the statutory consultation and pre pre planning uh, submission. Okay, thanks. Can I now go to our officer, um, presenting officer? Uh, there were a number of questions there that I, I think were mostly to the applicant, but I think we would want your view in particular on Alan's question about the wording and what it means. But any other matters that you think you need to add on if, if you do? Thank you, thank you, Chair. So just yeah. in, in terms of the hours of construction, so I believe it's the update report that um, Councillor Griffiths is referring to. So the ministerial statement allows uh, that came out on the 13th of May allowed a, a relaxation of the hours of construction. So this the additional wording that's been added to the top of it is only for external internal works. So it wouldn't be allowing external demolition or construction works to happen. It would it's mainly allowing from 8 a.m. to 9 p.m. Mondays to Saturdays internal works. And then from the 14th of May, 2021, it will go back to our standard wording, which are standard hours of operation, which are between eight and six, 6 p.m. Monday to Fridays and between eight and one on Saturdays and no other times, including Sundays and bank holidays. So it's Thanks. only, yeah. Uh, is, is Alan uh, gesturing that he has something to query there? I'm afraid so, Chad. I'm hearing, yeah. I'm hearing what was Carl is saying. Mm. But I've also got my other screen here with the new document on, and it, they don't quite match. <laughs> so oh. I am concerned. <laughs> so, 
So uh, you read the word in safe for deliveries, there shall be no external demolition, construction or building works carried out on the site. Except between the hours of 8 and 2100. Okay, that, was, that's, that's, that would require a correct, correction on that part then. Okay, fine. So, Thank you very much. Yeah. <laughs> right. so it's only to allow internal works to happen right. between those yes, hours. Sir. Fine. Thank you. I'm happy with that. Great. Thank you very much. I've got a couple of more indications from members. So Carleen hasn't spoken at all and wants to say something. I'm going to go back to Rachel. I don't, I'm not seeing any other indications at this stage, but Carleen, did you have something? Yes, please, Chair. Thank you very much. I'm, I've gone through this document and I don't seem to be able to find the um, wording or what's going to happen with the flagpoles. And I do notice that there is objections from residents in regards to the flagpoles, where will they be situated? I would like to just find out some detail of, of that. I also, um, uh, I do appreciate that we've spoken about security, but looking at the objections from the residents within the local area, there are concerns about disturbance and I just, I, want, I guess what I wonder is, I appreciate security of the building. It sounds to me that you're moving your security team over to this building. Um, but what does that mean for the actual, for instance, lobbying outside and the security that is needed for that, for those purposes? Could, could there be some type of elaboration on that, please? Okay. Um, can I go, first of all, Rajvin, do you want to say anything on the flagpoles, is there anything you yep. can elaborate on? There? So on page 91, there are elevations which show that the flagpoles, there are three that are located on the western side of, of the building. And so they're in quite close proximity to the elevation of the building itself and situated far, and far uh, away from the Emirates airline itself and also from residential um, buildings. So that'll be on page 91, it's the second box in from the left. So there's three lines and they're standing to a height of 10 meters, I believe. Might not be clear on there in terms of the measurements. It very much isn't clear on there yeah. in regards to the actual drawing itself. So can you just um, just what am I looking at here? Am I look am I looking at the back of the building, the side of the building? What am I? That'll be at? the eastern elevation that faces towards the dock. And then on page eighty seven. Yeah. So if you follow the red line boundary on the right hand side, it juts out to a rectangular piece that juts out and there's three dots on that right okay so that would be the three, yeah so they'll be on the eastern side facing the public realm thank you thank you very much oh yes i see it um okay thanks um and is it really for the applicant carleen's clarification about the wider security of the well the sort of public realm i suppose in a way um just does the applicant have anything to say on that uh, yeah, um, at this point, I'll bring in my colleague, Simon Grintar, who can, who can provide an overview on our plans in regards to disturbance and security um, outside the building. Uh, Simon? Thank you. Um, when you talk about disturbance outside, you mentioned lobbying, so I'm assuming you're talking about protest and that kind of thing. Um, that is something we're well, well used to, um, and we are trained security team are used to handling that. So the key thing for us will be to ensure that the protest is managed safely and that the rights of others to enjoy the space are not um, disadvantaged as a result of that. And obviously we would want to maintain access to the building at all times. Um, so in terms of lobbying for specific meetings, that kind of thing, we have a plan in place for that and we'll be dealing with that. In relation to the flagpoles themselves, you also mentioned the flagpoles, <clears throat> excuse me, a little bit more clarity on the flagpoles. Uh, we use them to fly the union flag, um, flags of visiting dignitaries, um, those, those sort of things. Um, often we'll hold a ceremonial function there for Arms Forces Day or, or that kind of thing. So um, traditional flagpole uses, as, 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 you, as you would imagine. I hope, I hope that ans answers the, those questions. Arlene's coming back, I think. If you don't mind, Chair, I'm, yeah. I'm, I am aware that obviously Rachel does, Council of Trip does want to come back in also. Is it a separate point or a new point? No, it's, it's literally on this point. Yeah, yeah, carry on, okay, carry on. Brilliant. Yeah. Okay, so just in relation to the, the protests and the ability to safely secure that, 
what I would like to ask you is, obviously, we've never had that type of thing here in, in this locality in regards to the uh, Crystal Building. I just want, what I'm asking is, would it be in a dedicated area that will not affect those residents that are living within that area? Or is it that just protesters can come anywhere around this building and protest? I'm just wondering, would it be contained? Or would it be that, you know, I appreciate that your um, team is very skilled, um, but I'm also very much aware that our residents were there first. And so therefore, their voices should obviously be heard, if that's okay. Yes, of, of course, I can elaborate a little on that point. Um, most protests are usually advised in advance. So we're expecting people to come because there's a particular committee going on in the building um, or you know, something that's happening in, in the chamber that they would want to make their views heard. Um, in those circumstances, and yes, we usually cordon off an area um, we will be using the grass at the front of the building, probably near the flagpoles, um, because these people need to um, have a view of the building and need to understand that you know, their protest is, is being acknowledged. Um, so yes, um, everything you say, it, it will be in a defined area. Now, from time to time, there will be unexpected protest. And obviously, at that point, we will engage with the protesters and try our best to get them into a sensible area and say to protect the rights of others to access the space and use the space. And obviously, in extremis, we would work very closely with our police colleagues. We have a good relationship with our police colleagues um, as, all the time anyway. But normally, most protests happening during office hours and are associated with our, our daytime meetings. I hope, I hope that helps clarify that point. Okay, thanks. Rachel, you want to come back? Um, yes, related to and uh, following on from the questions about um, transport more generally and about the public realm, it occurs to me that as well as the interaction of the building through the public realm with the water, there's also a really important site behind this one, um, which is a triangular site, which I believe is a housing one um, through Populo. And I guess I... We need to be really certain that there'll be really good integration and cooperation there between those two sites, because we need, in terms of what we know that Newham needs, we really need both of those sites to work really successfully, both in their own terms and also together. So it'd be good to have some indication about that. Um, again, not to keep on going on about it, but to come back to this issue about parking spaces, it sounds like what you're saying, although it's not in paper is that we're really looking at three disabled spaces and then two mayoral spaces is that right and I just given how hard we push developers on reducing parking spaces and given how resolute we are at this stage of development around transport um, I'm just I'm, I'm, I'm a bit surprised to be honest to see an application with two out of five dedicated spaces um, for this position and um, like I say particularly in the context of the mayor of London's transport plan it just seems completely antithetical to what we're all trying to do to me. Uh, yeah, I agree with that. Um, I, I wonder actually if we want to hear from our transport advisor because uh, it does seem a bit odd. My, my comment, uh, we've had three mayors of London so far, who knows what happens next year, that's not a matter for us. Uh, but in different ways, they've all been characters who we have seen getting around in ways that aren't the car. I think Ken Livingstone was particularly uh, notorious right at the beginning of, of saying he wasn't going to travel around in a car. Uh, Boris Johnson famously going around on by bike, and we've seen Sadiq doing that recently, uh, which seems like the right approach, and that's reflected in the policies. So it's completely baffling. But what does our transport advisor say about this? Uh, thank you, Chair. Through you, um, it, my thoughts exactly. Um, I totally agree with the council trip and uh, we highlighted these concerns to um, TLA and uh, at may many um, uh, meetings. Uh, they're obviously looking at it as a different sort of application. It's a special case uh, and that's where we had to um, subside on this one and that's that's where we're coming from in, in regards to accepting those two car parking spaces. But yes, uh, the policies pretty clear, uh, you know, car free development, uh, the only other requirement would be blue badge. And, and that's, that's where we are. Thank you. 
Okay. I will ask the applicant if they want to add, but before I do, Rachel, you've got your hand up. I'm sorry, Chair. How can this possibly be a special case? Think of all the things that go on across Lo across London. I mean, it's um, it, it's just it's outrageous. Uh, you're expressing my sentiments. Um, does the applicant team have anything to say? Well, so I, I, I will come back um, alongside my colleague Dan Bridge on the relationship to the Triangle site in a moment. Mm. On, on, on the specific question around security, um, uh, and, and we, we need to be um, I need to be careful here and sensitive in in how um, I and, and colleagues respond to this question. Just 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 to manage that. Um, but um, there are particular security requirements um, for the building, specifically relating to the GLA. This being the this being uh, the new city hall and the GLA um, and its and its permanent occupants, um, of which will be the mayor um, and the London Assembly. Um, and um, we have again, without in, in trying to respond to this in, in, in the appropriate way, albeit you know this being a public forum. Um, we have had to undertake certain assessments around security and have taken advice as to um, what, what we need to provide in order to ensure um, an appropriate level of security for um, to, to, which is commensurate to, to the usage of the building and the, um, uh, uh, and the high profile nature, for want of a better term, of the permanent occupants. Um, so at this point, um, I'm going to bring in uh, Simon uh, Grinter, my colleague, and again to elaborate. But but just 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 to be clear, you know, th this is this is quite a sensitive um, um, area, and um, I hope what I'm saying um, uh, does uh, you know provide a bit of context and a bit of sense. But as I say, I'll bring I'll bring Simon in. At well, this I mean, you you're, you're saying you have to be sensitive what you say. I I don't think I do. So I'll I'll say what I perceive as a situation which is that the mayor of london is an extremely famous person uh, that there are obviously security issues around that person him or her whoever that may be uh, we all understand that but we also understand that the policies are quite clear um, and um, we also know that that is reflected in the presentation not only of the incumbent mayor but all his predecessors um, so um, we can call a spade a spade and talk about the, 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 the site and what its purpose is, uh, but they should be travelling by other means. Uh, yes, and, you know, in practice, um, you know, the mayor, I am sure, um, will, will um, endeavour to do so. But um, just, just to be clear, I think, you know, we have as I say, um, taken specific advice from the appropriate authorities. Mm. Uh, and um, the advice has meant that we've had to approach the design of the building and in particular the security provisions in a specific way um, to mitigate um, uh, potential security risks. Um, and what, what do we say to every subsequent applicant who says we've got a special case here? Um, I'm, I'm not saying that at all. Um, but, you know, we, we have tried to reflect and the very specific advice um, that we have had, and 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 also, we, you know, we try to be consistent with the current provision that we have at City Hall, based on the specific advice that we've had from the appropriate authorities. So, so you mean the City Hall in uh, More London? Uh, yes. Yeah. So, which was um, being built, I remember, twenty years ago, and we have new policies now. So, we are we are looking at a different attitude to um, parking and in fact Ken Livingstone was quite clear that he wasn't adopting the approach that the the system had facilitated for him of, of having a chauffeur driven car so we've moved on from that so we don't want to replicate uh, what's in more London um, we've also got very clear advice from our transport officer that this is not policy compliant and we have to be quite clear with a lot of applicants who are pleading a special case um, and so I'm struggling really why we should make one here. Um, I, I guess, um, you know, the, the final point I'll make on this before I bring in, bring in um, Simon to elaborate further is, um, you know, the, the security risk, as well as the policy, other policies that we had 20 years ago, um, 20 years on the security risk has also changed. Uh, so, you know, that, that is a point here worth, worth bearing in mind. Um, but Simon, I'll, I'll bring you in at this stage. 
Thank you. Um, I think the point the point I have to make is that um, due to the nature of the GLA and its functions, um, we do receive protected visitors to site and the parking spaces are associated with the vehicles for those protected visitors. Um, I can't really go into too much more detail in a, in a public in, um, arena. Uh, I mean, don't people who have kind of high levels of security, they have to travel to all sorts of venues with sort of doing engagements. And so they have that this kind of arrangement at every every site they visit. I mean, it just doesn't I don't I don't you know, it, it doesn't really make sense to us. Um, but if, if, if I can just make a final point on this, um, um, which I hope will help to further clarify. Um, as I said, the, you know, we, we consulted the authorities as we're required to do, given that it's a public building and it houses um, the mayor and the London Assembly. And taken into consideration the advice that we've given by that we've been given by the security authorities, um, we have had to reflect that in the design of the building to mitigate that risk. So I, I think I think you know that's that that's genuinely the the, the rationale for the approach that we've taken. Right, I've expressed my grumpiness. So we've got Alan and Rachel who want to say something. Alan. Yes, thank you, Chair. I think the applicant's been a bit cagey, but I seem to recall that um, when the then president of the English FA came to the old football ground for the unveiling of the statue, he was accompanied by some rather heavy looking characters who came in big cars. And I think that might be what it's about. So I think we'll have to let this one go. OK, well, yeah, I, 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 th I, I was thinking similarly, Alan, but um, yeah, anyway, mate, Rachel. Um, I'm sorry, Chair. I... <laughs> I don't really want to let this go. I want to come back to your point. What, what do we then say to all other applicants for all other sites who come back to us and say, well, yes, I understand what your policy requires. And I understand what the mayor of London's policy requires, but I have particular advice, which I'm uncomfortable to share in a public forum, which means I need these particular arrangements. I, don't, I mean, I'd also remind you that, you know, the, the mayor of London's transport policy does not say car free developments unless specifically required for security arrangements. And you're, you're perfectly right that whoever the mayor, he or, he or she, the mayor of London is, they are a high profile person, but there are high profile people moving around all parts of London in all different ways all the time and going through a whole variety of different buildings. And as you said, um, they do not and cannot expect there to be secure, dedicated parking facilities in all of those buildings. And we know that they don't exist in the buildings that are really old, for example, um, and neither will they exist in newer buildings, which are policy compliant and car free. Um, so I, I don't see why we shouldn't have an amendment of this to make it compliant with our policy. And just to press the point again, the policy of the mayor of London who is using the building. OK, so, Rachel, um, you're suggesting that we um, amend uh, if we approve this, we should approve it without the two secure parking spaces. Uh, can I just check from adv uh, advice from officers? Is that is that possible for us to do that tonight? Uh, who am I looking to? Uh, Um, I'm, I'm happy with that, uh, Chair, if that's the an answer you require from me. Okay. I mean, it's, it's policy compliant and I would go for that. Okay. Um, and uh, applicants, how do you feel? I mean, I haven't asked all the members. They may vote against Rachel's proposal, but how would you feel if um, about that? Chair, just while they're think, just yes. while they're thinking yeah, about yeah. that, um, could I just help with um, mm. what the strategic development committee may be resolving uh, yes. to do? Uh, yes. Is that to um, submit an updated uh, updated ground floor plan uh, that would be for approval uh, to officers that would not include the car parking spaces? So I think I think the motion is to include an updated plan for approval that would supersede the current one we got. That's exactly um, what the motion is. Thank you for clarifying that, James. Thank you. Can I check, first of all, is, is there a seconder to Rachel's proposal? Uh, John Whitworth is seconding. Okay. Um, uh, Ricardo, and now I think is uh, 
coming back on his uh, view. Um, yes. Um, so one final, final point on this, um, mm. uh, on the back of uh, the discussion is, it's just, it's just to state that this is ensuring that we have adequate security arrangements is fundamental um, to uh, uh, our reuse of the building. So uh, note and obviously take on board and respect the uh, motion and proposals of the committee. Um, but this is, um, this is quite a fundamental um, uh, issue for us. So um, I, thought, I thought that would be helpful for me to raise at this stage. Okay, I think members uh, will all independently assess this. Rachel's made a proposal seconded by John. If I may, um, there's been a lot of discussion already. I'd like to go straight to a vote. Uh, how do members feel about Rachel's proposal? All those in favour? That's three. Thank you. And all those against? Four. So that falls. So you're just about in luck on that, although we haven't approved it yet. Um, uh, but I think the, the strong views of the committee have been expressed. Uh, I think we probably need to move on because of the time. Uh, so there is a recommendation for approval. Um, I, it's uh, on page, is it 15 or 16? 17, sorry, of the, recommend, of the bundle. Um, is it okay if I go straight to a vote? Can all, I see all those in favour of approval? One, two, one, two, three, four, five, six. I think that is, unless anyone's going to correct me. Thank you. All those against? Zero. Any abstentions? That's me. Um, thank you very much. So that has been approved. Uh, thanks, everyone, for your time today. I think we need to move on. Thank you very much. OK. Thank you very much. Um, agenda item... Um, is it six railway tavern um just a reminder um that i think a number of us on the meeting tonight were at the previous meeting where we voted to defer this item so um i think there is a lot of familiarity with this application um do we want to hear first from the applicant yeah. yes harvinda chair i'm sorry um i know it's not procedural could I ask for a two-minute comfort break, please, before we go to the next item? Yeah, I think that is probably reasonable. So it's um, uh, 27 minutes past. Can we try and be back at 8.30? Uh, I will make sure that the members on the call are, are visible before we start. But try and be three minutes. OK? Thank you. Thank you, Chair.
Okay, I think we're waiting for one more uh, committee member who needs to be, or well, maybe two actually, but one's just seemed to be appearing. And the other, okay, I think we've got our legal advisor and we've got our members. And if the clerk is ready, we can stop uh, uh, the notice saying we're in a break. And I think we have some of the applicant team on. So uh, the applicant team, I, I don't know if you um, have a presentation or you're just going to address us briefly but you have uh, five minutes if you want to address us. Remember, many of us have heard from, I uh, know about this scheme before, so it's really about updates, although not everyone has uh, deliberated on it before. Thank you. Yes, thank you, Chair. I'd just like to make a short presentation, if that's okay. Mm, yeah. Is it okay if I share my screen? Um, if you're allowed, you might have to be, you are a co-host, yes, in that case, carry on. Can you confirm you can see that first slide? Mm, yes, thanks. Thank you. So good evening. Uh, my name is Brian O'Neill of Cantrell and Crowley Architects. I'd like to bring you through a short presentation to set out the design changes that have taken place since our previous meeting in September. This first slide here, uh, we start with an aerial view showing the position of the site on Angel Lane shown in red. This is close to the town centre, as you know, and the train station with the tall buildings just to the south. This image submitted to the officers highlights the greening and biodiversity spaces, including the creation of a biodiversity area to the southern and adjacent to network rail. And this is the proposal that was considered by the committee in September with a six storey central block and taller tower to the south comprising 14 storeys. So this is the amended design for consideration today. This image demonstrates the reduced height of the central block by a storey, bringing it in line with the original consented scheme. The taller block has also been reduced by a storey to the left shoulder in addition to a three meter reduction of the glass element in the center. And I can move between those two images there, which just illustrates those changes a bit more clearly. We've also added architectural relief to the side of the taller element and the central block. This image also shows the new two-way side of track and the pedestrian crossing leading from the now pedestrianised junction at Windmill Lane, semi-mature trees are introduced to the external areas to promote urban greening and a softening of the public realm. Aerial view looking southeast, the cycle route and pedestrianisation of the public spaces are more evident here in this shot. And this shows the new courtyard between the original tavern and the new building. This also allows the restored tavern to remain prominent in its original setting. And a view along Windmill Lane towards the tavern. This is identical to the consented scheme. The route to the town centre would be partially pedestrianised with an added pedestrian crossing making this route safer. Now I'd like to bring in my colleague Ian to discuss daylight and sunlight if that's okay. Good evening. My name is Ian Thody and I'm the Daylight and Sunlight Consultant for the applicant. We undertook an assessment of the daylight and sunlight and overshadowing impacts to neighbouring properties in line with council policies and with BRE guidance. My plan on screen shows each of the neighbouring residential properties with compliances shown in green and minor breaches of the guidance shown in amber. Our assessment showed that the current proposals are in accordance with BRE guidance with the exception of some minor impacts to isolated areas of Bellhaven Apartments, Stratford Eye, and the recent development at 3 to 7 Windmill Lane. It's acknowledged in the BRE guide that it's intended to be used flexibly, particularly in dense urban areas. Uh, with this scheme, the impact upon these properties range from negligible to minor. In the case of 3 to 7 Windmill Lane, this building blocks its own light 
having a habitable outbuilding within its own rear garden. Um, I'd like to address some direct uh, or direct some responses to some comments raised by local residents. Um, firstly, flat six of Granary Court raised an objection. Uh, our submitted report includes an assessment of Granary Court and shows full compliance with BRE guidance. Uh, the residents of 21, 33 and 35 Windmill Lane. We have assessed the impact of daylight, sunlight and overshadowing within numbers 9 to 19 Windmill Lane and these show full compliance with BRE guidance. Numbers 21, 33 and 35 Windmill Lane are located further from the development than, than those assessed and also show full compliance with BRE guidance. Uh, numbers 204 and 505 Carriage House uh, this building is set approximately 65 metres from uh, you've the, got existing one minute. Thanks. Railway, Thank you. the existing railway tavern building, um, which does not change as part of the development. And it's approximately 100 metres from the taller part of the development. Um, as shown, its windows face uh, east and south and do not have a direct view of the proposed development. So there would not be any material impact uh, at this distance. And I'll hand yes. over now to my colleague Jeff Field to talk about some yeah. planning stuff. So, so I have to be very quick, uh, Jeff Field here. Um, what we would conclude is that the scheme is compliant with policy SP4 in terms of accessibility being sensitively designed and also the generous public realm that's being created. Um, in, in addition to the environmental issues, there are many economic and social benefits as well. And I think that's probably my time's up now. Yeah, that's it. Thank you very much. But that's no problem. Thank you very much. That was very clear. Um, if you could take that down, we have an officer presentation now. Um, Sean, yes. Thank you, Chair. Hopefully you can see that. Yep. So the item six relates to the railway tavern on 131 Angel Lane in Stratford. Here is the site location. And here is just a, an impression of the, the surrounding um, residential occupiers. Uh, the application is for the erection of a 412 room hotel in a building of up to three, five and 14 storeys with ancillary bar and di dining facilities, outdoor space, landscaping and servicing provision, including the retention and exterior refurbishment of the main part of the railway tavern hotel building. This is a major application. It is a departure from the local plan and the railway tavern is a locally listed building. So the application uh, was, was on the September 2020 uh, Strategic Development Committee and it was deferred. Um, so the application that was present, presented to that committee was for a 418 room hotel um, and that had uh, building heights of three, six and 14 storeys. The uh, Strategic Development Committee deferred the application to allow for the submission of a res revised design, particularly in relation to scale and massing, and to provide details on how this would impact on the daylight sunlight to neighbouring properties. The committee emphasised that the design is revisited to take on board the view of the DRP, so that's the design review panel, that it would be more satisfactory if the long block was lower. So um, as you can see here, there's two images. So the, the one on the left-hand side is uh, showing this middle block, which goes up to six storeys. Um, and up here, you can see a 14 storey block, which is closest to the railway tavern. Um, in the latest amendment, the applicant has embraced the comments made by DRP, as well as the uh, Strategic Development Committee and the middle block is now five storeys and the um, so the upper block has been reduced by one storey and three uh, meters overall 
uh, the I should also point out that public realm improvements have been made. So the footway um, to the front of the uh, property um, has been, um, so part of that has been given over to provide a, um, a cycleway, a two lane cycleway, um, as well as a pedestrian crossing, which will be fully funded by the applicant, which is just uh, by these planters here. So here is some key visual imagery of the proposal. As you can see, the, the crossing which be, would be provided by the applicant is here, as well as the uh, proposed public realm works and the cycleway. And this is the rear of the development, which includes uh, a number of uh, green landscaped areas with a, a green wall as well. Uh, this is the side of the proposal, uh, the design of the uh, the hotel on this elevation would match or be sympathetic to the existing character of Windmill Lane. The, um, it's, it's necessary to look at the acceptability of a tall building in this location. So the applicant here has provided a study just to show how uh, this particular um, area steps up towards the taller buildings in Stratford. It's at a, a, a transition um, in uh, the local character in terms of tall buildings. Um, officers consider that the proposed development is sensitively scaled. Uh, so this just shows uh, the amendment to the central block. So here in red is the, the previous six storey part of the building. Um, in September, uh, officers uh, presented an amended scheme with a setback here. Um, and then um, the current proposal following the comments from SDC and DRP are for the removal of the upper story. And as you can see here, it, that is supported by DRP. So uh, in terms of the design scale and massing, the design has been refined through pre-application engagement together with the DRP. Uh, the DRP are now fully supportive of the scheme, particularly the refinements made to reduce the height of the proposal and its design. To summarise, an amendment was made to reduce the sixth storey of the middle block, the 14 storey tower has been reduced and a new brick detail and relief added um, and officers and the strategic design manager are supportive of the design, noting its sympathetic relationship with the retained pub. Throughout the pre-application stage and the planning process, the proposal has responded positively to the DRP officer and SDC um, comments. The officers consider that designs, the design, scale, height and layout of the development represents a scheme that would deliver a high standard of design. Uh, the architecture is uh, also considered to retain a high quality design as well as a number of landscaping uh, improvements or additions that have been discussed. Uh, a number of recommended conditions are uh, set out to um, ensure the quality, the design quality um, when, when it's built and um, there are recommended head of terms to ensure the, to, to ensure the quality of the architecture comes through in, uh, so that it's realised in reality. Uh, in summary, the proposed development in respect to design is supported. Impact on amenity. This was one of the key issues picked out previously uh, by uh, SDC. The application is supported by a daylight and sunlight report undertaken in accordance with BRE guidance. Uh, BRE guidance is supported by policy. Um, in, in urban areas, we acknowledge it's not always possible to achieve the target BRE uh, daylight and sunlight levels often due to the existing environment. Small deviations are therefore regarded to be acceptable in urban areas. The degree of harm is judged on a case by case basis by officers, taking into account the model in and results of the BRE assessment. So as you can see here, I've set out um, where the, the, the BRE assessment has um, supported or, or shows that there would be an acceptable impact on um, nearby residents and those resident, residential buildings are marked in, re, uh, in pink here. Uh, the applicant has also summarised this uh, in, in their presentation previously. Um, so as you can see there are some minor um, parts where, the, uh, where it doesn't quite meet the BRE guidance but it's considered to be close to and therefore 
it's acceptable um, in, in this urban context. Officers are satisfied that the uh, daylight and sunlight report appropriately assesses all the surrounding residential uses. Overall, the assessment indicates that the levels of daylight and sunlight accord with the BRE guidance. It is noted um, in regards to daylight that where the assessment does not strictly meet BRE guidance, the rooms affected would be kitchens or be very close to the BRE standards, which is considered to be acceptable in this urban context. In terms of sunlight, a number of windows would fall below the BRE target as a result of the development. However, the uh, daylight sunlight report indicates that they are close to the targets required and this would be acceptable in this urban context. It is considered that the proposal would therefore retain acceptable levels of daylight and sunlight in accordance with the requirements of planning policy. Um, in terms of, uh, I'm moving on now to privacy and outlook, the design of the proposal has sought to minimise uh, overlooking by orientating windows and terraces away from the neighbouring habitable room windows and amenity spaces. There is considered to be a sufficient distance to neighbouring properties to prevent undue harm to outlook. Noise and air quality. Noise impacts from the proposal um, are considered acceptable on balance, given that the site is currently occupied by a pub and guest, uh, guest accommodation and benefits from planning permission for a hotel already. Um, environmental health did not raise any concerns about air, quali uh, air quality or noise quality, but suggested conditions. Those conditions are applied um, in, the, uh, in the officer report. Overall, the proposed development with respect to impact on amenity is supported. Other considerations were taken into account in the assessment of this application. This is the principle of development, employment and skills, impact on biodiversity, accessibility, secure by design, transport and travel, energy and sustainability, and flood risk management. Um, in regards to all of these matters, the application is supported. Uh, here is the uh, results from our uh, consultation exercise. We have uh, one letter in support, um, nine objections, and two neither um, supporting or objecting. Strategic Development Committee is asked to note the committee update and resolve to agree the reasons for approval as set out in this report, delegate authorities to the Director of Planning and Development to finalise the drafting of the planning conditions at Appendix 1 of this report, refer this application to the Mayor of London as a Stage 2 referral, and subject to the Mayor of London advising that he is content to allow the council to determine the application itself, delegate authority to the director of planning and development to grant planning permission, subject to the completion of a legal agreement under section 106 of the town and country planning act, based on the heads of terms identified at appendix two of this report and the conditions listed at, listed at appendix one. Thanks very much. Um, can I see the screen again? Thank you. Um, any members have questions or comments? Um, okay, we've got Rachel, and that looks about it. We have, of course, discussed this before. Rachel. Um, thank you, Chair. Um, I'm, I'm glad to see this coming back, taking account of some of the comments that we raised last time. Um, I did just have a couple of minor things I wanted to ask mm. about. Um, I, I think I asked last time about the fact that the residents, um, the nearby residents, commented a lot about the possibility of parking via Millstone Close. I know this is outside of the scope of the planning application, um, but I wondered if it's possible to hear either from the applicant, who I think the residents believe is the freeholder of that site, um, or from officers that this could be taken away perhaps by the Stratford councillors and had a look at because it may be outside of planning but it is obviously very important to those residents that have responded. Um, my other queries um, are again both about transport. I just wanted to clarify on page 167 um, when this development is car free um, does that mean that it also won't these staff members there won't be able to apply for business permits? Um, and I also wanted to ask about the cycleway outside um, the proposed hotel, which is very welcome, um, but it looked from the um, diagrams as if it wasn't um, physically segregated from the cars in any way. And I just wondered whether we could um, take that back. 
um, I know from experience that where cycleways aren't physically blocked from the road, um, that cars will just park in them or drive into them. Um, and any kind of safety, in particular sense of safety for cyclists, um, is in danger of being lost. Shall I go to our transport advisor first, who I think can probably may have an, something to say on all of those points. And then you suggested that it might be interesting to hear what the applicant says about being the freehold on a non-planning matter. Well, so I don't want to take up too much time on that. So let's go to, where, where is he? Oh, I'm here. <laughs> oh, there you are. Sorry, if you've moved around my screen. Hello. Thank you, Chair. Um, so I take the three questions. Let me take the business permit first. When we, uh, Council Trade, when we talk about car-free development, that that applies to residential and any other commercial development as well. So the so the agreement that they will be signing will be uh, taking into consideration uh, all that. So it will be the whole of the all of the uses rather than just uh, the residential or even the uh, hotel. So that that's that's uh, how we would be approaching that one. Uh, in regards to the cycle parking, I think it's very indicative in the drawings. We've done a lot of work with the uh, develop, developers consultant and it will be a segregated um, a cycle network. Um, and that's a scheme that's, in, uh, that, that's being designed uh, at this very moment. And yes, your point your point's taken in regards to uh, the um, conflict between the cars and any other vehicles. So that, that will not happen. Uh, it will be purely for the cyclists. Um, in regards to the, uh, uh, I suppose it's, it's a drop off and pick up you're concerned about in the uh, no road, uh, um, and that we would be, uh, we have considered that very carefully. The transport assessment has indicated very low percentage of drop off and pick up. Yes, we take that with caution. Uh, there is a travel plan. Uh, which we'd be looking at and making sure that uh, the model share is very much by foot cycle and uh, other means rather than people being dropped off and picked up. Without. So there is a strategy as well for the drop off and pick up with this particular site. So we, we will be keeping a close eye on the uh, drop off and pick up in relation to taxis and so on. Okay, can I, Harvinder was indicating, can I take him next? Yes, yeah, Chair, thank you. I might have missed it at the last committee meeting, Chair, but uh, um, just want to ask a quick question, uh, page 111, by one of the objectors, the closure of Windmill Lane at the junction of Angel Lane, Leighton Road. Is this something to do with the, the works which the council has undertaken or will be undertaking which will be partly funded by the applicant, and is this part of the transport plan to do the closure if it goes ahead? Chair, can I come yeah. back? You that? certainly can, yes. Yeah, it is the um, neighbourhood uh, schemes that the council is looking at, and it is part of our schemes which we are rolling out in, in the borough, uh, and it, uh, you're quite right, it will be funded by the applicant, uh, it is subject to consultation and a lot of other requirements that uh, that's needed for any environmental scheme. So yes, you know that that's that's how that we are approaching that particular scheme. Thank you. Um, is there anyone else? Um, I don't. I can't see anyone. Um, I um, did just want to check. Um, this was obviously deserved deferred um, uh, in large part for design reasons. I didn't know if either our strategic design manager um, or our, the uh, chair of the independent design review panel who's here tonight want to add anything to what we've read in the committee report about the updated scheme. Um, you don't have to add anything, but I just did want to give you the opportunity given this was an area of particular concern to members. Uh, ben Hull. Um, I was just going to say as, as Neil's here tonight and, and the and the present and the scheme was presented back to him. I wondered if he would come in just to summarise his view. Thank you. Yeah, th thanks, Ben. Um, yeah, I think we, you know, we we had lots of positive conversations with the applicant um, over a long period of time, and the um, and it's very good to see the um, applicant responding to the final comments that we made. And I do think it's made all the difference to the to the scheme and to the project. And I think it's those um, final comments that the 
um, a committee of ours for have made really major benefits to to the scheme. Um, I do think, though, that the, the applicant should be um, you know, commended for their um, selection of you know their architect because I think they've um, exhibited a really constructive attitude um, all the way through the process, and I think the um, you know the building has got huge constraints on the site, and they've done a, a very good job, in my opinion, in the panel's opinion, to overcome those constraints for the quality um, proposal. Thank you. That's really helpful. I suggest actually we move to a vote now. Um, I think uh, it's a very welcome uh, uh, amended application that we're, we've got today, and I, I certainly will be voting in favour of it. So the real recommendation is on page 95. Uh, can I see all those in favour? Seven. Uh, that is unanimous, so that matter is approved. Thank you very much. Just a reminder to anyone who's wondering, I don't have the members in one place, so I have to look around for hands. Okay, I did say we I, we would move around slightly. So rather than deal with the next agenda item, we move to agenda item eight, list of community school. Um, uh, that is on page... Um, 225 and we have a team uh, presenting. Um, Chair, if I can yes, come in for a moment, can certainly. I be reminded who from the applicant's team is going to present? Mm. Yes, um, hello, good evening. Um, uh, so my name is Richard True from Rivington Street Studio <coughs> Architects. I'll present a short uh, presentation. I'll share on the screen, um, but we also have um, uh, Jim Robinson from JFK Special School um, and Simon Round and Jamie Isles from Lister Community School to answer questions. Great. Um, I think so. Richard True has now been made a co-host, I believe. Um, so if you want to share your screen um, and I will uh, time you for five minutes. Okay. Um, <clears throat> can you can you see that? Yep, thank you. Thank you very much. Um, so these um, proposals provide much needed SEND provision space as a satellite facility for JFK Special School. Uh, although it will be run by JFK, the students will benefit from the use and integration with Lister Community School. Um, in this aerial view, the um, SEND provision facilities will be located um, in the corner of the site um, uh, Junction Road and Northern Road. Um, the um, SEND accommodation will be within a single storey um, bulge block built um, in 2018 and at the end of the existing southeast wing of the main school within the boundary shown uh, on this site plan. Uh, the other component of this proposal is the reprovision of classroom classrooms displaced by the SEND accommodation uh, and this will be provided in a new first floor extension onto the 2019 bulge block adjacent to the kitchen and dining areas. Also noted on this plan in light grey here is the, the new extension as part of Lister expansion scheme which this committee saw and approved in September this year. The expansion scheme is not shown in this application as it hadn't been approved at the time. However, the proposals have been carefully considered and integrated into the expansion scheme. So this is the 2019 bulge block, which was designed to take a future first floor extension. Uh, the five new classrooms within it will connect to the existing school via an external walkway, uh, and the ground floor gets opened up to form an expanded dining spa space as part of the expansion scheme. As you can see from this elevation and 3D view, the materials and form follow the existing ground floor rain screen cladding and window arrangements. Um, and a double height um, canopy provides much needed external covered space over an important circulation route for the students from the North playground to the dining area. Uh, these photos show the site for the JFK satellite unit. Uh, the single storey bulge classroom block is on the top right. Um, and the new drop-off area and entrance um, to the bottom left. 
So this plan shows the new internal and external spaces. Um, it will benefit from a variety of external areas which will be landscaped with the students' welfare and needs in mind. Uh, the landscaping includes outdoor gyms, sunken trampolines, growing garden and various seating and planted areas. Uh, and the mini bus drop off is an important aspect to the students' care and day to day experience. It is proposed to form a new crossover here, um, and mini buses will enter via an electric gate. A marshal guides uh, the buses in, and then students can safely get out uh, without um, this causing disruptions on the pavement and highways. Uh, this will only be used at the start and end of the day. At other times, this area forms an external amenity area for the students. And here we have the proposals within the context of the expansion scheme. Uh, it should be noted that um, uh, these proposals and those of the expansion scheme are fully integrated and meetings with highways have been happening to ensure the proposals are integrated into the new and healthy school streets proposals. Thank you. If you uh, any questions, as I said, um, uh, we have representatives from JFK and Lister Community School. Great, thank you very much. Um, if it's okay with members, I'll go straight to uh, the officer presentation first. So, um, uh, um, thank you, Chair. Yeah, oh, you're, you're, you're ready to go. Sorry, I was being slow. Thank you, okay. carry on. I'll share my screen now. Thank you. Can I confirm that you can see my screen? Yep. Item 8, so this is for Lister Community School. The site is situated within Plasto, bounded by St Mary's Road, Junction Road to the south, Northern Road to the east and Queen's Road west to the north. The application seeks the erection of a first floor extension, external access walkway and canopy to the existing single storey building, the retention of the existing temporary single storey classrooms, new site access gate, entrance and associated landscaping to a new send provision facility within the school buildings to the southeast corner of the school site, including the new minibus drop-off area. These images are the view from the southern boundary from St Mary's Road and Junction Road. The images are the view from the eastern boundary, Northern Road. The lower left image shows the existing classroom block. These images are the view from Queens Road West. This plan shows the proposed site layout. The areas where the SEND provision is located is highlighted by the dashed line to the eastern edge of the site. The location of the first floor extension is towards the centre, closer to the western edge of the site and also out outlined in dashed lines. The first floor extension, as noted in the applicant presentation, will connect back to the main building. This plan depicts the layout of the SEND provision, including the external trampolines, seating areas, outdoor gym, growing garden, and the bus drop-off facility to the south. The dashed line around the area indicates the extent of fencing that is proposed, which is for safeguarding of SEND pupils. These visuals depict the first floor extension and the canopy to the existing single-storey dining building. Key planning considerations are the principle of development, the design, transport and travel, and the impact upon amenity. The principle of the use of the site for education is established and the council would be supportive of facilities that provide additional educational facilities to meet the growing and diverse needs of the borough's young population. Officers recognise the immediate benefits that this proposal would provide in relieving pressure on send education places within the borough. The extensions and the addition to the existing facilities are therefore supported. In terms of design and appearance, the proposed materials palette is considered to be of high quality and would complement the existing buildings to ensure that the new development creates a cohesive addition to the site. Overall, the proposal is well detailed and the scale and layout of the buildings are considered to be appropriate and complementary to the site context. Individually and cumulatively, the various elements of the proposal, including the landscaping, is considered to be proportional to the existing school site. The massing and scale is appropriate to the content of the school and is considered acceptable for its intended use. The design of or takes into account the needs of the school and the SEND pupils and is therefore supported. In terms of transportation, the site achieves a PTL of two to predominantly three across the site. The site does have 84 car parking spaces and 96 park parking spaces in their current form. 
LBN Transportation have reviewed the proposal and subject to conditions relating to the school travel plan, highway improvement schedule, construction logistics and transport management plan raise no objections. The development is acceptable in relation to transport and travel. In terms of the impact to amenity, of the 133 neighbours consulted, no representations have been received from the public. Notwithstanding, officers have carefully considered the proposals and subject to conditions is anticipated not to have an unacceptable impact upon neighbouring residential amenity. Members are advised to note the committee update report for the corrected recommendation and resolve to agree the reasons for approval as set out in this report to delegate authority to the Director of Planning and Development to have regard to and consider representations that are received following the expiration of the ongoing consultation on the 9th of December 2020. Should any matters be raised that have not been considered within the report, the application will be reported back to committee for its consideration. And three, delegate authority to the Director of Planning and Development to grant planning permission based on the conditions listed in Appendix 1 of the Officer Report. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, any members have questions or comments? So I've got Alan, then John, then Harbinder, then Carleen. Thank you. Yes, thank you, Chair. I'm not sure it's a question to the applicant or to the planning officer, but I didn't quite get where this where this location was for the minibus to come onto the site for the special education special educational needs pupils. It, it uh, would be. Should I share my presentation one more time? Yes, yes please. Yeah. Yep. Okay. I, sh I should pay more attention this time. <laughs> so looking back. So in this location, can you see this area here? I can see. If my cursor is moving, I don't know if you can see my cursor moving. Ah, right. Yeah. I see. So it, it's close to the end of the the wing of the of the main block. Yeah, so it's in the southeastern corner of the site. Right, so okay, got it. Right, yeah. thank you. Thank you. Next was John Whitworth. Thank you, Chair. Uh, yes, on page 252, um, paragraph 78, we're told about a non-see-through fence that will surround the, the new SEND area. Um, we're told it's for safeguarding, but I'll just like a bit more explanation for about the reason for this um, non-see-through fence, please. Can I just see what Harbinder and Carleen's questions are before we come back? Um, but I've got that point, so Harbinder. Yeah, thank you. Just a quick note. Um, uh, a question in the sense the two rooms which are marked as on page 271, uh, the calm rooms, uh, I'm not too well conversant with that. Would that include the sensory rooms as well, please? Okay, and then Carleen. Um, I guess, thank you, Chair. I guess I just want to give credit where credit is due. Looking at these these um, plans and seeing the, I guess for me, seeing the, the the level of detail in relation to what you're providing, I'm I would I'm very much welcome. The, um, the things that you've thought of, for instance, the sunken trampolines, understanding the, the uh, children with ASD that are complex children, these, these specific areas will be of, of much benefit. Um, I just wanted to ask you a question in relation to, um, and this is just me being cheeky and I do apologise, but I, you know, forget it out there and it's out there. Um, in regards to the therapy room, and I'm assuming that will be um, some type of um, sensory ther therapy. Um, is it going to be state of the art? Um, in, that's my question. Will it be um, very much what you would expect in 21st century um, th therapy rooms? And if so, could you just give me a little bit of detail? I appreciate that you might not know the detail, but considering looking at these these diagrams I would say that you've given a lot of consideration to what's going in to this this part of the school building so I would like just a little bit more detail if you don't mind. Okay so should we go back to the applicant then uh, of having doing Carleen's questions about rooms and then there's John Whitworth's uh, clarification about the fence and safeguarding and so on so 
the applicant team want to come in on those? Okay, I think I think perhaps Jim from uh, the, the head teacher at JFK would be good to um, uh, talk about the um, calm rooms and the therapy rooms and the fence. Yeah, hiya. Can everyone hear me? Yep. Great. Um, sorry, laptop issues, so I'm on a, a mobile phone. Um, the um, the calming spaces, so the cohort that we're potentially looking at for the site um, in order to meet need within the local authority, local area, um, are learners, predominantly learners with ASD, um, autistic spectrum condition. Um, this often, a, a number of those students, so the fencing, the calm rooms all sort of relate to the same the same areas of need. So it's all to do with supporting regulation. It's very easy for some of our students, some of our learners at our other, our other JFK sites to become dysregulated. Um, an excess of sensory input uh, leading to challenging behaviours or simply a, a lack of engagement with a learning activity. Um, so the idea of those quiet spaces is to provide exactly that, a, a space that is uh, that won't have an awful lot of sensory input that allows students to access uh, a space without um, any distraction and to learn from their own, their own physiological responses, how to regulate themselves over time. And that's something that we do have at, at our other JFK sites. The, the bonus with having the number um, on this site means that we can also double up, and I know the sensory room was, was referred to, use, use those spaces as sensory spaces at other times by having more mobile sensory equipment as opposed to static sensory rooms as you have in uh, settings that are afforded a little bit more space. So we can be creative around that use and it can be used to either stimulate or it can be used to support students to regulate um, depending on their emotional, emotional state at a given time. And linking to the fencing, um, again, the fencing is there predominantly to avoid that overstimulation. A number of our students um, do have areas of particular interest. Um, it's not uncommon for um, cars and vehicles to be um, to be among them. It's it's a it's there to avoid that overstimulation and to enable focus and engagement on the activities and the learning activities within the setting. Has that answered the yeah, question? I think so. And then is it a separate person who's answering about the therapy room as a specific? I, I can answer come? about that. Right. Yeah. Um, so I think really the, the question was around the, um, the uses for the therapy room and whether they will be state of the art or not. I think um, whilst there are a number of state of the art uh, therapeutic approaches, I think that there are some equally as valid, quite old school, if you like, uh, therapeutic approaches that, that stand the test of time. And I think going back to those quiet spaces, I think it's about making the spaces multi-purpose. Um, we don't want to have a, a therapy space that is very much fitted out for a specific type of therapy or a therapeutic approach, um, Thrive or, or something similar. What we need, we're looking at a, a cohort whose needs are gonna be quite varied um, and we will need to be able to adapt to meet uh, and personalize our provision to meet the needs of, of a number of learners with, with very broad, um, and at times quite complex needs. So the exact resources relate to the exact learners who are going to be based there at any given time. And obviously we don't know that yet. We're still in conversation with the local authority around 
identifying individuals. Once we know who is going to be there, the idea would be to adapt the therapeutic approach um, and approaches available and therefore the use of that space as best meets the needs of those individual students. So it's all about adaptability as opposed to identifying a, a therapeutic use for that space. Okay, um, did um, the officer want to add anything to those, answers to those questions or is, is, was that, yeah. Thank you, Chair. Just in relation to the fencing, yeah. so we have got a condition for a landscaping which also includes details of fencing. So in terms of the wider character impact or impact to the road itself or Northern Road, that will be considered as part of the condition. But we acknowledge the safeguarding in, and the calming environment that it provides by creating a more enclosed space for the students. Thank you. And Harvinder wants to come back. Uh, Chair, uh, thank you, Jim, um, for the detail you've given us. Um, considering the, the diversity of our communities that live in our borough, do you think that we are able to cater for the needs of some of the communities? And there might be some cultural issues that might come through as well. Uh, I'm not quite sure about those, but um, I'm led to believe that there sometimes is something that's more sensitivity to do with the culture and the diversity we live in. Um, I think that there are, there's an inevitability in education as in most areas um, that culture will play a part. Um, and it's important that organizations are reflective of their the communities they serve. And I think JFK, um, our other three sites, work with all members of our local communities and try to serve them as best we can. And, and again, to be adaptable to, to need. I think at the center of everything we do is an emphasis on personalization of our approach to meet the needs of individual students. And we, we, we can't do that and not also be adaptable to views of community groups or, or wider groups within our, our society. So those, those types of challenges that sometimes can arise from, from uh, specific, uh, specific areas are, are things that we, we deal with very well, I think, um, and quite frequently. So I don't think there would be anything distinct about the Lister setting. Um, as opposed to our existing sites. Okay, and then Carleen wants to come in again, and then I, th I think maybe we can move to a vote. Carleen. Um, thank you, Chair. Just quickly, I just want to ask a couple of questions in relation to the hygiene room. I'm assuming that would be a room adapted for, um, for children with complex needs in re relation to changing rooms. And the other question I wanted to ask, and maybe this is the detail and this not for this committee, but I'm just you know, going to take the opportunity and ask. The common room life skills room that we have here, um, obviously I welcome this type of room. It's important for our children with SEND needs to be able to, to learn life skills for their futures. Um, is this a room that could be, is going to be something like an adaptable flat to teach them those life skills? Um, yeah, it would, it would be... What we would like to create is something close to a, a nurture space that you might find in other similar settings. Um, and really, it's about timetabling and uh, uh, use of that space. What we would want to try and do is, is have it uh, be as responsive. Again, I, I know I seem to keep coming back to us being responsive to, to need, but ultimately that is what, what we need to be. And, so there, there would be potential for that space to be used as a breakfast club, as a space for students to come in and regulate, to learn to have, you know, those, those sort of family time in the morning and, and sit around in, in, a, in a less formal setting before settling down to, to learn. So opportunities for regulation. Later on in the day, there would the hope is that it would act as a common room for students when they are, um, able to to access that um, and then there would also be timetabled sessions where it would be used in a more formal sense as a as a space to teach 
um, cooking um, and other domestic skills. Um, in relation to the, I think the first point was about the the um, hygiene room. That would be a wet room um, for use in the event that students may may have accidents or um, yeah display more complex behaviours. Okay, I can't see any more indications. If everyone's happy, I will move to a vote. The recommendation is in the officer update as amended from page 227. Um, can I see all those in favour of the recommendation? Seven, that's unanimous, that is approved. Thank you very much. Thank you, um, the team for attending. Okay, so now agenda item nine. And I believe we have Philip Taylor here. Uh, from the applicant. Um, are you uh, presenting a PowerPoint or just addressing us? What's... Um, hello, Chairman. Um, <clears throat> I was hoping just to answer any questions that, that that's, may arise. That's always fine with us. So in that case, we will move on to the officer presentation. Um, and that's Adam, I think. No, can I be seen and heard? You can be seen and heard, thanks. Okay, as soon as it Thank you. Uh, this application relates to the site at 14 to 28 Bromford Road, Stratford. Here, shown here is the application site in its relation to the wider borough. And here you can see the application site in its relation to Romford Road. It's the red line. You can see the red line boundary and the extent of the site. Its application is for full planning permission for change of use of 14 to 20 Bromford Road from use class E to use class C3 ancillary residential and external alterations and refurbishments associated with the wider, resident, wider residential conversion of the former Stratford office village to residential use, including installation of replacement windows and doors, repairs to the roof and installation of photo, photovoltaic panels, ground floor facade enhancements to the Bromford Road frontage, erection of external refuse recycling and cycle stores, associated work to the landscaping boundary, treatment and car park. This is of course located with the Stratford St. John's conservation area. Um, a quick word on the history of this application. Um, it permitted this, the residential units to which this relates were permitted under permitted development rights last year in 2019. Permitted development rights for office to resi residential were introduced in 2013 as a means of increasing the housing supply. Um, however, this has resulted in removing local authority and control over the location, amount and quality of housing provided. As said, 158 one bed dwellings were approved in May 2019. And as these are achieved through permitted development, the residential units are not for consideration as part of this presentation. Uh, shown here is some key visual imagery of the proposal in a night showing the frontages from Romford Road. The principal of development. Uh, Stratford is of course located with the strategic site uh, SO5 Stratford Central, which places an importance on the renewal and reconfiguration of the existing retail offer. offer. Uh, it is expected to scope for expansion and, compar and comparison floor space together with other town centres and residential uses. It, for, uh, policy SB3 of our London local plan also places importance on the need to avoid problems related to bad neighbour uses and keep avoid vacant premises. As you can see here, you can see the vacant uses at the phrase in Romford Road. Um, retail studies have been included with the application, which demonstrates that the loss of commercial units in this location will be justified. The studies show there are a number of vacant units within Stratford that have recently been marketed with some being of a similar scale to the US of 14 to 22. Uh, the applicants also argued that there is a decreasing demand for retail restaurant floor space nationally, and this trend is expected to continue as a result of the impacts of COVID-19. Officers are mindful that a sufficient amount of time has not elapsed to demonstrate how COVID-19 may impact business closures, 
Uh, however, it is also noted that there is changes to the use class to allow additional flexibility for the change of use without full, full planning permission, which would allow for a wide, wider range of uses. That relates just to here. These are the use class E's. And of course, in September of this year, changes to use class orders meant that these can now be converted into different uses outside of planning. Um, it is proposed that the units under this application would become part of the wider residential development, although not directly for accommodation purposes. Uh, the proposal will seek to create an access point to the development and a shared space that will be formed of resident post boxes, a reception area, a backup house for any on-site staff, an internal shared amenity space that will be available for all residents to use. This would also provide a certain degree of communal space for home working. Officers consider that this change of use would be acceptable in principle and satisfy policy requirements by bringing vacant units back into use and providing a use that is appropriate for its, appropriate for its context without causing significant harm to the existing retail offering structure. Um, notwithstanding, it is noted the change of use is only acceptable as, as an ancillary component of the overall residential con uh, conversion. Therefore, a condition has been placed to ensure that pre the prevention of the units being occupied prior to the commencement of this planning application. This can be found at Appendix 1 of the Officer's Report. Design. With regard to the units that would be subject to a change of use, design amendments have been proposed to show a continuous active frontage with glazing brought down to ground level in order to maintain the existing character of the street. Proposals retain a shop front style with the existing brick columns retained. Entrance points have been rationalised to one key point of access of the Romford Road. A number of design changes are proposed to the wider former Stratford Office Village. It's proposed the existing windows will replace double and triple glazed UPVC windows with a similar appearance but improved thermal and environmental performance. It is also proposed that the existing timber effect cladding is replaced and photovoltaic panels to be installed to the south facing roofs, carefully located to minimise their visibility from the conservation area and to minimise the impact on the street scene. Additional works and brick, such as brick cleaning and roof repairs, will also be carried out to improve the overall appearance of the building. LBN Strategic Design Manager has been consulted in this application and is satisfied the works of the building are sympathetic to their character and appearance and are considered to have a minor beneficial impact in terms of enhancing the Stratford St. John's Conservation Area. Landscaping works are also proposed. You can see these at the bottom of the slide here, uh, which is primarily comp comprised of hard stand standing and car parking spaces. This would also provide defensible spaces adjacent to habitable ground floor windows and would increase the overall biodiversity of the site. A number of green roofs are further proposed for refuse and cycle stores. Uh, the LBN manager has commented on the landscaping also, and overall the inclusion of landscaping within the site is supported, but we would like further details that will be secured by condition. Again, secured by design accreditation will also be, is also secured by condition, should the application be approved. Transport. Proposals include the provision of 27 car parking spaces, 10 of which would be disabled bays. Originally on site, there was 67. This under the pre-application, sorry, the prior approval would be reduced to 48. And so there has been a reduction on space. Yeah, the, the level of car parking on site has been reduced significantly over time. When in use as B1 offices, the most recent former use of the site, provision of car parking was total of 67. Uh, LBN Transportation and TFL have both commented on the planning application and reiterated the policy position with regards to the provision of parking. Uh, the applicant has been encouraged to reduce the proposed level of parking to 16 accessible spaces, however, have provided justification as to why this cannot be achieved at the outset, but they are accepting of the need to monitor demand over time and adapt the provision based on the evidence base. Given the reduction of spaces and vehicle movements, officers consider the proposed provision, proposed provision of parking is acceptable, subject to a number of conditions that would mitigate parking pressure and, say, uh, and seek to reduce parking over time, or respond with resources initiatives that would respond to local demands in relation to parking. You can see uh, on the slide the number of transport related conditions, uh, which are construction logistics plan, delivery and servicing, travel plan, car parking management, that's the specific one that would monitor the decrease in parking provision, residential car parking, which would ensure that it is only taken up by residents, and permit-free development, which is 
in conjunction with the car parking management plan allows for monitoring of the spaces. Of the consideration, amenity. The proposed change of use of the ground floors is not considered to have any negative impact upon neighbouring community. There is no increase in massing, overlook or impact upon the streets seen beyond that of the existing use and heritage. The application is located with this within the St. John's Conservation Area. Historic England have assessed this application and have advised there are no concerns, as has LBN Strategic Design Office. Proposed materials are considered to be similar to that of the extant building and would not be detrimental to the current appearance of the conservation area. The current waste provision is considered to be acceptable. Uh, that's one of the few things we can consider under the prior approval. However, further details regarding spaces for bulky waste provision is secured by condition. Energy and sustainability, updated windows will provide a breadth of BREAM compliant, it would be better BREAM compliant. However, uh, solar panels, green roofs and increased landscaping all provides better sustainability and biodiversity than what is currently offered by under the prior approval. Letters were sent out to neighbouring properties. One objection was received. This was in related to the amount of car parking on site and reiterating TFLs and London Borough of Newham's concerns. Um, Strategic Development Committee is asked to note the committee update and resolve to agree the reasons to, for approval as set out in this report and delegate authority to the Director of Planning and Development to grant London Borough of Newham Planning Permission subject to the completion of a legal agreement under Section 106 of the Town Country Planning Act based upon the heads of terms to be identified at Appendix 2 of the officer's report and the conditions listed within Appendix 1. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, could you remove the uh, PowerPoint and that will help. Thank you. Um, so I've got one hand in the air. Any others indicating at this moment, John, Rachel, John? Okay, so Rachel then, John, thank you. Um, obviously, officers have made this point in the report and I appreciate them um, spelling it out like this, but because we are a meeting in public and people may be watching this, I just wanted to put on record for the minutes how incredibly regrettable it is that the permitted development that's been introduced by the government means that this kind of residential development um, can be built with no kind of local authority oversight and all the questions that we would normally be asking like why are all these um, all these places one bedroom which doesn't reflect our local need why car parking spaces when that could be green space can we require play space um, you know all of the things never never even mind thinking about purport, the proportion of genuinely affordable homes all the things that we would normally look to get from a residential development in order to benefit the people of Newham and in order to deliver um, the kind of homes and houses that we know the people of Newham so desperately need is entirely removed from us by no fault of our officers um, just by this legislative quirk if you like um, and I just think it's really important to say for the minutes um, how undesirable the outcomes that that legislation produces are. Thanks um, I had similar thoughts in my mind and you articulated them very well thank you. Uh, John Whitworth. Yes Chair but I would also agree with what uh, fully agree with what Rachel has just said. Um, I've got a question about the, the landscaping and biodiversity it is pointed out, the strategic design manager has pointed out the lack of trees and shrubs and also the use of, of artificial turf. And we are referred to Appendix 1, but I couldn't find anything, uh, I couldn't find that addressed in Appendix 1. So I just, but are we, are we imposing a condition where this um, deficiency is addressed? That is where there is not the use of artificial turf and where there are more trees and shrubs? Yes, um, that's condition 11. Sorry. Sorry, it's, it's possibly something I missed. Condition it's 11. Condi it's condition 11 on the report, landscaping. Okay. Prior to the occupation of the development hereby permitted. Um, so we will get final oversight of those and that can be a later on discussion with the applicants. Oh, I'll make sure you. it's compliant. Thank you. Okay, I'm not seeing any further indications, uh, but I suddenly have James Beckles. Thanks, Chair. Um, it sort of ties in with what Rachel and um, John Whitworth have stated about um, the government legislation, which has led to somewhat the devaluing of the role of 
committees like ours, which seek to ensure um, high quality. But can we ask the developer if they would um, ensure themselves uh, and I guess for reputational purposes that whatever um, they do with this development, that it is high quality and meets the standards that they've set out previously when they were granted permission? Okay, well, you said you're here to answer questions. So, uh, Philip Taylor, there's a question for you. Thanks, if you want to answer. Of course. Um, yeah, I mean, I think that um, we obviously have tried to engage proactively with um, officers through um, two rounds of pre app that's been going on for the last nine months. And I think that that's been quite a collaborative process to sort of take what is a, a very simple and stark prior approval scheme to a, to an enhanced level. I think that there's been you know, con some considerable pushback from officers and they have made us jump through a number of a uh, number of hoops on this. And I think that there's been quite a lot of um, quid pro quos on how we um, reconfigure the parking spaces and we have substantially reduced that in uh, to allow us to offer better landscaping, planting areas and immunity space areas. Um, and try and balance that against the other sort of what we feel are sort of enhancements to the building in terms of more um, sound resistant insulated windows um, and improved BREAM rating, obviously the instruction of PVs, trying to sort of yeah, improve the sustainability credentials of the site, which is obviously something that is overlooked by the PD regulation. So we felt that we've sort of, you know, as I said, we've worked collaboratively with officers on this. And I think that the conditions reflect that there is a bit more work to be done, perhaps on some of these landscaping details and some planting. and. Yeah, we're accepting of that um, and I think we're accepting of the, also the issues about the car parking. I know that is a, a hot topic and that we are looking at a monitoring condition to um, take a real world view of how those parking spaces are used by private tenants of this development. This is a 100% PRS scheme. Um, the applicant retains 100% ownership of the parking spaces and units so they have control over those parking spaces and we are going to be monitoring how they're used, be it for uh, private residents, uh, accessible users, um, car clubs, the sort of EV users, perhaps. So we're going to have a hopefully have flexibility to sort of work with that those uh, that resource of parking spaces and allocate that on a more appropriate basis. But um, I hope that sort of helps sort of corroborate or <laughs> sort of help to sort of um, infer how we're trying to sort of yeah move this beyond, above and beyond what is a sort of a, a normal common garden sort of um, PD scheme um, to something that's a bit more high quality. Okay, uh, I'm not seeing any other indications. So shall we move to a vote, which is on page 279 of the bundle? Um, all those in favour? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Hang on, have I lost anyone? Yeah, oh, I've lost myself, that's right. So we're seven. Uh, thank you, that's unanimous. That is approved. Thank you very much. Right. Can I now go back to um, agenda item seven, where I believe we are, we are hearing first from the committee um, report officer uh, who... can't see on the screen chair that would be me um oh, but right, i hi. think there may be um a speaker is, is that right someone, oh yes so objective? what i was that's right what i was going to do because of the nature of the agenda item i was going to take you first uh, just so that was clear what this was about for so they could tailor their comments if that's okay yeah. thank you Can you see my screen? Yep. Great. Okay, so item seven relates to land at Thameside West and Carlsberg Tetley on Dock Road, Silvertown, um, commonly known as Thameside West. So here's the site location marked in red in the Royal Docks area. And this is the site area shown in, um, in red. This is the surrounding um, surrounding key sites, so the development site. 
So by way of background, the application was presented to Strategic Development Committee with an officer recommendation for refusal in November 2019. The Strategic Development Committee resolved to refuse the application. Um, there were 15 reasons for refusal. On the 2nd of December 2019, under the Mayor of London's direction, the GLA took over the application acting as the lo local planning authority. This made um, Newham a consultee to this process. Um, on the 15th of May 2020, the applicant made a number of amendments to the scheme um, in consultation with the GLA and uh, LBN. Uh, so Newham prepared a representation in response to this amended scheme um, to the GLA maintaining a, its objection to the scheme. And um, eight of the original reasons for refusal still stood and the objection was made on that basis. A hearing was held by the GLA on the 5th of August 2020 and the mayor, the deputy mayor of London considered and determined the application. It was resolved to grant permission for the application subject to planning conditions and the conclusion of a section 106 agreement. So this, um, just to give an overview of the application, it's a 5,000 um, uh, residential unit scheme. Um, which is um, also includes a number of commercial uses. Uh, the full description of this application is shown in the uh, in the committee report. So, since the um, approval by the GLA, LBN officers have continued to work with the GLA and the applicant to negotiate the heads of terms for the Section One Six Agreement. Continuing to negotiate um, allows for mitigation of uh, negative impacts of the scheme. Officer negotiations have been under the direction of the Mayor of Newham, who was briefed on the 3rd of September 2020 on the options identified by officers. The parties to the agreement are actively discussing and negotiating the Section 106 agreement, and officers consider that the parties are close to agreeing uh, the Section 106. Why would um, Newham be a signatory to the Section 106 agreement? So LBN is a signatory um, or proposed to be a signatory to the Section 106 due to some small parcels of land within the application site falling within its ownership. Options identified uh, by, the, by officers are as follows. So there's two options. Uh, the first being to continue negotiations by being a, sec uh, a signatory to the Section 106 agreement. Um, by um, being party to these to the um, section 106, Newham can positive, positively influence and negotiate the best outcomes to mitigate negative impacts of the development. This may also help with monitoring and give greater control to the local planning authority. Uh, the heads of terms uh, negotiated so far are um, shown at Appendix 1. Option two would be to not be a signatory to the Section 106 agreement. However, this would mean no longer working with the GLA and the applicant to monitor and negotiate the heads of terms for the Section 106 agreement. Um, Newham's legal team advised that the most likely outcome from this action is a unilateral undertaking, meaning that uh, Newham would not have the ability to comment or agree any of the terms that are agreed and we would only see the, the, the what had been agreed once it's been signed. So the officer conclusion, not being a signatory to the section 106 agreement is a consideration given the council's continued objection to the scheme. It is noted that uh, Newham would be unable to ascertain until signed if any of the terms negotiated by officers would have been applied. Um, officers are of the view that continuing to be a party to the negotiations allows for better outcomes to mitigate the negative impacts of the scheme. Once the Section 106 agreement is signed, um, Newham would be responsible for monitoring, enforcement and approval of the terms of the Section 106 agreement. And that would be, you know, this is quite a lengthy scheme and will take many years to, to approve so that, that, that does carry some weight. It is important um, that the terms of the deed are undertaken in a constructive way and LBN 
continues to influence the terms of this substantial development, as, as mentioned. Officers therefore consider that the most appropriate way forward is to continue to negotiate the terms um, and to enter into a section 106 agreement. So the officer recommendation here is, is, is as follows. Um, Strategic Development Committee is asked to resolve to note the committee update and agree the delegated authority for the council to enter into a section 106 agreement with the applicant, the Greater London Authority and Transport for London as drafted within the report. Thank you. Thanks. So have we still got Dave Coppard? Um, yeah, I'm still here. That, if you can hear me. That, I can hear you. So um, obviously you've heard it's a, quite a narrow, well, relative to the entire scheme, quite a narrow thing we're being um, asked to agree in relation to the Section 106 that has been, um, to the scheme that has been approved by the Mayor of London. So um, we agreed five minutes on all matters, so you can speak for five minutes against this, but obviously you don't have to use up all your time, but you may start, thanks. Understood, right, yeah, I won't use the whole, whole five minutes. Um, yeah, as, as the officer said there, I mean, residents here seem to be in the same position as the council. We, we're still largely against the scheme, but it is what it is. It's been approved. Um, in reference to whether LBN should be a signatory, I think the general feeling here is that that's a good idea for the reasons mentioned. Engagement with development is viewed as a positive thing from what I can ascertain by local residents. But just one thing that I would like added to our attention here is when the section 106 is being negotiated, that I think we all hope the gravity of this scheme is uh, understood, that it is 5,000 new homes in an area with very few homes already, and there'll be significant impacts on transport, education, access to healthcare, and that kind of thing, which we all hope will be duly considered in the section 106 process, to which we're all in support of LBN being a signatory too. So thank you for that. Oh, OK. Then. Can you just because I know you've addressed this committee before um, and you were talking about speaking to various residents, could you just outline your capacity for the record about how you've been or why you you are, have been engaging with uh, other people? Because it may not be obvious to people listening to this meeting. Yeah, sorry, I'll repeat the same blurb from previous previous mm -hmm. times that um, uh, this Thameside West development is adjacent to Western Beach Apartments which is a collection of 120 apartments just over the road. That's governed by a residence management company known as Britannia Village 9 Limited, to which I'd served as a director for most of the planning process. And as part of that, I regularly consulted with the 100 or so people here and anybody else who wanted to put their voices across. So that's, that's how I'm collating these, these views. But we're very much at the tail end of that consultation now, given it's been, been approved. Thank you very much. Okay. Um, any comments or questions from members? Uh, right. So, Rachel, thank you. Um, Chair, I'm very sorry to get on my soapbox again, but I promise to be really brief. Uh, I just wanted to say it's really disappointing, for, um, and I don't express that disappointment in terms of the officers um, to be here because we are a really pro development authority and we have really positively engaged with the need for new homes, including taking some really difficult decisions about density and, you know, all kinds of things, reflecting the fact that we want new homes to be built in Newham that people need. Um, and in this case, we had a number of really, really quite significant objections. And obviously, despite those, uh, this is going ahead anyway. Um, I think in light of that, the officer's recommendation is very pragmatic and sensible. I agree. Um, anyone else? No. In that case, we will move to a vote. Um, it is on page 216 of the bundle. All those. Do we have James Beckles here? Maybe he's. He is here. Hi there. Okay, can we see all those in favour of the recommendation? One, two, three, four, five, six. That is seven. That is unanimous. That is approved. Thank you very much. And um, thank you uh, to the uh, Britannia Village representative for continuing to engage. Thank you. Okay, so we are nearing completion 
agenda item 10 um, is the report um, review of the London City Airport 2019 annual performance report. Uh, this is uh, required to come to us under Schedule 14, Paragraph 6.3b of the Section 106. Um, as we know, we've been on this call for ages and online meetings are not even good if they last more than an hour, never mind where we've got to. <laughs> um, my, my suggestion, um, because I do want this discussed um, and it's come before as it has to, and that's fine, is my proposal is that we note the report and that we agree to convene a future meeting uh, dedicated to discussing the contents of this report, any addendum and any related matters. Um, does anyone um, object to that proposal? Um, no, I've seen some nods. And can I check with the clerk that that's the appropriate way to minute this? Yes, Chair, thank you. Thank you very much. Okay, on, the, on noting it on that basis, can I see all those in favour of noting the report? Right, that's seven, that's unanimous, thank you very much. And then finally, agenda item 11 is the planning protocol. Uh, remind me who is um, introducing this, is it James Bolt? Thank you, Chair. <clears throat> Just to say that the planning protocol um, is intended to uh, go to, I understand, full council meeting at a date to be confirmed. We just wanted to have this on the agenda for members noting, but um, happy to also take this away for uh, further discussion if uh, members uh, would wish. Still on mute, Chair, sorry. Thanks. Um, can I check... Um, that um, it is it, uh, considered that this protocol will go to full council after um, the next strategic development committee meeting, we, i.e. we don't have a date of it coming up in the next couple of weeks or anything like that. I mean, I know it's on next week because I've seen the agenda. Amanda? I don't believe it's listed and we can arrange for that to happen. Yeah, I think it might be sensible um, that full council can hear that we've we probably deliberated on this, having had an introduction to it uh, from the officer tonight, and we can go away with that introduction to it um, and come back uh, should members feel the need having looked through it. Is that okay, uh, Harbinder? Yeah, thank you, um, Chair. Uh, I think I might have copied you into some of the correspondence I've had with mm. um, officers as well. Um, just to note, uh, for my own sake, really, um, there was something which was mentioned at the last SDC committee meeting, which some members uh, are aware and officers are aware. And I'm just mindful that could there be something in this report, how we deal with some of the uh, terminology that's used, which might come back to haunt us one day? Okay, and I'm sure um, those conversations can continue um, at a worthwhile point, which at five to eight, um, if it's okay, I don't intend to ask for elaboration on. So let's, let's definitely come back to that. On that basis, do, uh, can I check? We don't have to do anything. We don't have to vote on anything on this. We just uh, say we've dealt with agenda item 11. Is that right? It, it's for noting, Chair. Thank you. Oh, so right. Uh, okay. Uh, so um, um, sorry, sorry, Chair. Can I come in? Um, yes, yeah, certainly. Um, sorry, I just wanted to want to be clear. Um, it, the report is for noting. Mm. Um, uh, is your intention to go through it at another another time to comment on it? And yes. Yeah, so, so should we defer noting it till the next meeting? Is that I think that'd be better. Okay. Or, or in that another case. meeting. Yeah. Okay, well, so my proposal is we defer this item. Um, uh, can I just have a wave of an arm for a seconder? Rachel, uh, all those in favour? Right, great. That item is deferred. Thank you very much. Um, date of next meeting is the 26th of January 2021. Um, I don't have anything else to say on that. And if no one else does, I will um, close the meeting and thank everyone for attending. Thank you very much. Thank you, Chair.